provide requirement for rental and or for sale include the following categories of affordability. Moderate, low income, very low income, and or extremely low income or some combination thereof. That we also explore incentives for developers beyond those already available through current city law and state law. That the options to meet our requirements would also include an in lieu fee, on site, off site, within a defined proximity to the project, and purchasing of affordable covenants as prioritized by the housing department. That the ordinance be citywide, that it have a minimum project size to start between 20 and 50 units, that it be mandatory, and that it ensure that the ordinance developed can be efficiently and effectively enforced and monitored. Explaining why all Angelenos have an interest in developing a strong inclusionary zoning policy, District 13 Council Member and Council President Eric Garcetti talks about affordable housing and cites other milestone legislation that's made LA a leader. But there's been too many fights that we've been uh, in together, and this is not about me, this is really about the community. There have been over a thousand units of housing in Hollywood, over 6,000 units citywide. There's been too much affordable housing that we've built against the opposition of many people who don't want affordable housing or think that it's ugly or think they don't want those people in their community not to set the record straight about how strong Housing LA has been in the last decade. Um, who've put an affordable housing trust fund front and center that was the largest in the country, both in absolute terms and in per capita terms and inspired things like a nas national uh, housing trust fund. Um, the protections that we've done together to close loopholes of illegal evictions to ensure that, that tenants who are dislocated have a higher amount of money. All of those battles that we've fought are real public policy that has happened in here. And it's happened in here because there's been a coalition of a strong council together with a strong community, an impatient and an impassioned community that has come together with religious institutions and labor and elected officials from other cities who show us you don't have to be scared about these policies. They do work. They can work. We've been together on those ramparts. We've been together on those battle lines. We've protested together. We've rallied together. And we've had many successes. But one glaring hole that we have in the city of Los Angeles is we still don't have, and excuse me for being old school, an inclusionary zoning policy. A policy that mandates that when there is housing that is, that is built in this city, that a portion of that be built for folks that are working class as well. Now, there's an interest in doing that because it's the right thing. But even if you don't care about those people, people and you want to say that, that those aren't you, you have an interest in this if you're stuck in traffic today. If you, if you live in the west side of Los Angeles where there's five jobs for every one unit of housing, you have an interest in this. If you drive in as one of those workers who spends 90 minutes or two hours and comes so early you sleep in your car so that you can then begin work after that because it's the only time to drive in with only two hours of traffic, then you have an interest in this. If your kids have asthma because of the air quality that's been an effect of our poor planning policies of the past, you have an interest in this. And if you're some Somebody who is opening a business and wants to attract a workforce that actually wants to come to our city, you have an interest in this. So from the business community and from the labor community, from a residential community, let's figure out a way not to rally around no, but to rally around yes, and to have a strong inclusionary zoning policy. Now let's go back in time, because if we had passed this, let's say in 2004, we would have thousands of units of housing right now for working class people before the economic downturn, when land prices were going up sometimes 50% a year. And the only adjustment that would have happened is that some some of the land prices would have gone up less quickly. Those landowners still would have turned a healthy profit. There's a piece of land in Hollywood in my own district that somebody bought for $800,000 in the 80s that was sold for $35 million. So if that had to have been sold for $25 million, I think they still would have been pretty uh, well off. That's if we had failed to do any of the incentives that should make this all else equal. It's way past time to act. And there are a lot of good reasons to support the mixed income ordinance. According to District 15 Council Member Janice Hahn, who says people are not able to make ends meet, and talks about the working poor. But I do feel particularly sensitive to the um, two million working men and women in Los Angeles, 50% uh, of whom make less than $25,000 a year or about $2,000 a month. Uh, and the average rent is about $1,600 a month. Uh, you don't need to be a math major to figure out that clearly it does not work. People are not making the end 
Americans meet. Um, there just are not any more affordable housing units out there for people. Um, yesterday in my office, I met with a hotel worker uh, who has struggled to find a place for his family to live. Uh, he had to move his family in with his brother's family in one small apartment, and then the rent there went up. And he once again was forced to move, and this broke my heart. He was forced to separate his family. He had to send his oldest son to live with the grandmother because they could not all live in the same place. Um, that is not family values. That is not American values. That is not what we believe in. And I've said this before, you should not have the working poor. That should not be in the same sentence. People who work hard should be at least well enough off to afford a place to live. Um, and you know that I have been fighting for years to get fair pay and fair wages and health benefits for working people. But I now realize that's not good enough. Because even with the living wage, um, there's not a lot of living to do if you can't afford a place to live um, and keep your family together. So I really want to thank the working group uh, that put together the guidelines that are before us today. I'm supportive of this, and I urge all of us to move forward and take a stand on creating mixed income housing in Los Angeles. The time is now. We have nothing to fear except a better, more livable city of Los Angeles. Thank you. And with that, let's go ahead and prepare the roll on this item. And tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Thank you. That is approved. Thank you all very much. And joining us now by phone is District 1 Council Member and Chairman of the Planning and Land Use Committee, Ed Reyes. Mr. Reyes, welcome to Council Week in Review. Well, thank you for having me, Mr. Popejoy. Very busy week for you in Council. Two major pieces of legislation, the billboard ordinance and mixed income housing. First, what is mixed income housing and why is it needed here in Los Angeles? Well, mixed income housing is the ability to look at specific sites within major corridors that have public transportation, major, what they call it in planning terms, major arterials, where you could have a percentage of different levels of housing for middle income, low income, and very low income folks. Uh, given enticements, given incentives, and given the community input that would go along with the process, it allowed for these new locations to emerge to meet the needs of housing for every income group. As you know, one of your colleagues said there was plenty of affordable housing in his district. What he really needed was more market value housing. What would determine where mixed income housing would be located? Well, it would be driven by one, zoning patterns that allow for that level of density, and the majority of those locations will be in high traffic areas, high traffic corridors that have public transportation. And so when you're having a mixed income, you could combine high income with moderate income, with middle income, with very low income groups under one roof. As you know, one other objection that you've heard, maybe from many people, is that it could tend to change the character of a neighborhood. Do you think that the provision you just talked about would ameliorate that potential problem? No, because the level of community input within the process of establishing these sites will include the stakeholders in every neighborhood. We're being very careful to make sure we preserve our bedroom communities, are historically sensitive areas. So having this process initiates the ability for all the stakeholders to have a level of participation that allows us to preserve these unique areas while preserving the character of our neighborhood. One of the other provisions that I know you've talked about and I believe is in the final language so far is the so-called in lieu of payment that a developer uh, might, uh, might offer to the city instead of having some of this mixed housing in a, in a particular development. Could you expand on that a little bit? How does that work? Well, essentially, you would be looking at an area of proximity to the project and allow for the folks who are building these facilities to create accessible, affordable housing within a certain range of the subject site. So those kinds of issues will be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, but it lends for more flexibility 
and alternatives to make sure that the middle class and all the other categories that we mentioned have the ability to live in Los Angeles. As we know, currently a large number of folks can't afford to live in Los Angeles, so they're commuting from large, long distances, uh, Riverside, Palmdale, increasing traffic, congesting our freeways, adding to the pollution. So our abilities to site these locations within a certain radius of the subject site will allow for folks to live hopefully closer to where they work. And of course, for those people who would prefer to see no development whatsoever, as I understand it, we're actually under state mandate to provide accelerating levels of housing to get more housing stock out there, aren't we? Absolutely. The state, and especially the federal government, uh, requires that we meet the needs of the working folks, the middle class, and we do have these requirements to provide housing given the levels of subsidies we are receiving from the federal government. The approval of this ordinance has now been delayed for, I think it's 90 days. Some see this as simple inaction by the council. What's the reason for this delay? Well, not at all. The delay really is, I wouldn't call it delay. I think it, it is a, a, a time frame that allows stakeholders to participate, engage their council members, and primarily inform people of what the facts are. What tends to happen is that Certain folks will provide misinformation on what this does, and because of the fear factor, you get reactions that are not based on fact. And so these 90 days will give everyone the opportunity to digest what we're doing, to engage questions, and raise the issues given all the different meetings that have already occurred regarding this matter. Certainly one of the most important matters before the City of Los Angeles at the moment, the Council and citizens as well, so we look forward to having you in the studio as this plays out to talk more about it. Let's move on to the billboard ordinance now. Billboards seem completely out of control in Los Angeles. What are you as a Council doing to remedy this billboard run amok situation? Well, the bottom line is we need to get enforcement in place. Uh, we are pushing to get uh, the type of ordinance that allows us to actually identify and limit the areas by which these billboards are allowed. Uh, we want to engage into a process where we can take down billboards, but primarily provide the kind of teeth in our uh, respective departments that can force the takedown of these billboards. The hope is with the new city attorney, uh, we can have a much stronger and proactive position in implementing and enforcing the law. And my hope is that every council member understands the impact on their district and look at this policy in such a way where we can actually see real results uh, with a new ordinance. One of the things that I know you've discussed in council, and I'm sure a lot of citizens come up to you as well and say, wait a minute, we have laws on the books, how come they're not being enforced? And that to me is one of the most disappointing realities of, of, of our process is that there have been laws in place, there are laws in place, and I keep asking the same question of our director of building and safety. The response is, well, the city attorney says, we can or cannot. There's a delay factor there that makes no sense to me, and that's what we want to eliminate. Well, we look forward to talking with you as uh, action moves forward on that front as well. District 1 Council Member Ed Reyes, thanks for joining us on Council Week in Review. Thank you, Mr. Pumpjack. Item 20 on Wednesday's agenda found the council considering the final vote on the city's budget for 2009-2010. At the request of Bernard Parks, chairman of the Budget and Finance Committee, chief legislative analyst Jerry Miller reviews some of the major issues of the budget. What is before you today is the, the budget resolution <clears throat> that really um, uh, uh, memorializes uh, the actions that you took last Monday. Mm -hmm. So this is the formal action that will, that will approve the budget and send it to the mayor. Under the charter, the mayor has uh, five business days in which to uh, uh, veto if he so chooses. If the mayor does choose to do that, then the council would have five business days in which to override. Um, the budget before you in, is a total of roughly $7 billion dollars, about 4.4 billion is, is general fund. Um, as you all know, it, was, it has been a very difficult year. Uh, the budget before you uh, eliminates um, uh, the mayor, it, mayor
has proposed elimination of 1,600 positions. Approximately 400 of those are filled. The council, in its budget, added uh, another 800 layoffs. So what you have before you is a budget that includes 1,200 layoffs. Uh, it also includes uh, 26 furlough days uh, for each employee, one furlough day per pay period. Uh, that is roughly uh, each civilian employee. That's roughly a 10% salary cut. Uh, also before you, you have attrition hiring for LAPD. Um, the the uh, fire sworn hiring plan is going forward unchanged. Um, and the budget has, in essence, uh, approximately, roughly 150 to 160 million in as yet unidentified reductions um, that will either have to come from concessions from the unions uh, or additional furloughs and layoffs. Um, that number represents the uh, sworn portion of the shared responsibility and sacrifice. So, let me just ask if, again, on that $160 million, if those dollars are moved totally onto the civilian workforce, what does that amount to in either layoffs or, or additional furlough days? Um, furlough days for civilian are about uh, four million uh, per day, so that would be roughly um, about another forty furlough days. Uh, if okay, we're all done the furlough. the furlough, right? Uh, layoffs are approximately um, uh, fifty million for every one thousand layoffs. Uh, fifty million for every one thousand layoffs, roughly. Um, so we're we're looking at uh, additional layoffs again. If we're all done on the civilian side and all by layoffs. So we're looking at additional roughly 3,500 uh, layoffs, give or take. That assumes seven months funding, so yeah. obviously decisions will need to be made quickly relative to whatever concessions we get because the, the longer that we take to launch the process of starting to cut back on, on staff, uh, the more uh, positions have to be eliminated. District 11 Council Member Bill Rosendahl, who also sits on the Budget Committee, seeks clarification on the actual number of layoffs and asks about union concessions. Yes. If we can't get concessions from the unions, we might have to lay off another 3,500 people from already the 400 and the 800. So how many people are we laying off right now uh, approved by the process? Is it 400 or is it 1,200? Uh, it's 1,200 that's going forward in, in your budget today. The 1,200 right. layoffs will happen when we approve the budget today. The yes. process will begin. The process will begin. Will there be anything to stop that from actually happening or are those 1,200 folks out of here? That would depend on on any concessions that we're able to get from the unions and whether that brings down our payroll on an ongoing basis. It, okay. it takes time. All right. So, so what kind of concessions would we need to have, forgetting the politics or any of that, to save those 1,200 folks that are on the block right now? Well, from a dollar standpoint, it's somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of payroll. And how that's made up, whether it's COLA givebacks, and I'm sure Ray, who does the negotiation, can perhaps get into more specifics. But at the end of the day, our payroll needs to go down by between 10 and 15 percent. Okay, Ray, let's go to you then. We're voting on something today, and I don't know the facts. You say maybe 1,100 positions, but you don't know how many of those positions are filled and where it's going. Is that right? Mm -hmm. that, that is true. I cannot tell you exactly. We, we know there are roughly about 300 filled positions in the mayor's proposed budget that, that are basically slated to, to go. Um, but it will truly be up to the, the departments to actually find out whether who actually will hit the, the, you know, hit the street. Jerry? Uh, if I could clarify, you know, it, unfortunately you'll never, you, you won't know exactly until uh, the point at which the departments actually come back to you with the deletions because it's constantly changing. Um, other things that could avoid layoffs would be um, there's discussion about a cash buyout program. Um, if, if attrition is higher, if more people retire, if, if people simply leave, all of those mitigate how many filled positions are, are, are actually laid off. So you, you, so you know the appropriation for the department, how the departments handle that is going to be the difficult thing. It equates to to roughly 1,200 what we estimate to be filled positions, whether 1,200 people are actually laid off is something that you won't know until we go through the process. Uh, that will close our uh, public comment. Any other members wishing to be heard? If not, we have before us this resolution. If we can please open the roll, close the roll, and tap
tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. That is approved. We'll send that forthwith to the mayor for his signature. So the budget will now go to the mayor for his signature. If the mayor vetoes it, the council will have to reconsider the budget. Now, if you have suggestions or comments about any of the programs you see here on Channel 35 or would like to receive a free viewer guide, call our viewer hotline at 213-473-3978. And remember, you can watch all Los Angeles City Council meetings live in their entirety on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays beginning at 10 a.m. On Sundays, you can watch the replay of all the week's meetings also beginning at 10 a.m. Council Week in Review can be seen Monday through Friday at 9.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. Well, that concludes our program for the week ending May 29th, 2009. On behalf of Tony Yagani and everyone here at Channel 35, I'm Jack Pope Joy. Thank you for watching, and please join us for the next Council Week in Review. Attention business owners, this is Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villagosa. Business is important to Los Angeles. It helps create jobs and promote economic development. By paying their fair share of taxes, businesses support essential city services, such as public safety. That is why the city is offering a tax penalty amnesty program through July 31st. Under amnesty, businesses that have delinquent city taxes or not registered with the Office of Finance can save up to 40% in penalties. But hurry, the tax penalty amnesty program ends July 31st. For more information, go to lacity.org slash finance slash amnesty or call 213-978-1555. seconds I'm gonna get hit by a car always look both ways before you cross drive with caution around kids traffic safety is everybody's responsibility watch the road City View Channel 35. Your city, your channel.
gentlemen, and welcome to the Los Angeles City Council meeting for uh, June 2nd, 2009. Happy June to everybody, and uh, June gloom is here, but nevertheless, we have a meeting for today, and we are here in the John Farrow Council Chambers, room 340 of City Hall. I want to thank those council members who are here pursuant to council rules on time. Council members Alarcon, Cardenas, Gruel, Han, Labange, Parks, um, Wesson, and Zine. We are awaiting one more council member. Uh, that is nine members, and we need ten or two-thirds of our 15-member body to constitute a quorum and begin business. So the following council members are late. If they will please make their way uh, to council chambers immediately. Council members Reyes, Rosendahl, and Weiss. Uh, Mr. Wiesar, Ms. Perry, and Mr. Smith are excused today, so we do not expect to see them. Uh, welcome to our viewers on Channel 35, as well as those who are here in Council Chambers. Uh, Channel 35 is a service of the City of Los Angeles and broadcasts all of these meetings um, on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays live, as well as rebroadcasts in the evening throughout the city's cable system. We're also available online through our city's homepage, lacity.org, uh, which has links to all of our city departments and city services and other ways to improve the quality of your life here in Los Angeles. It also archives our past council meetings online for your convenience and link to our agendas, which are also made available there online. And finally, you can uh, use your telephone to listen into council meetings. That's a service called Council Phone, and the number is 213-621-CITY. 213-621-CITY. And not only can you listen to uh, council meetings uh, um, here, but also any of our committee meetings are available through uh, council phone as well. Again, we're w waiting uh, for those late council members right now, uh, Mr. Reyes, uh, Mr. Uh, Rosendahl, and Mr. Weiss. Um, if anybody would like to be heard on any of the items that are on our agenda today, our cards are in the back of chambers or in our remote locations in Van Nuys and San Pedro. Uh, just fill out one of the speaker cards and hand it to the sergeant at arms or one of the city staff members. Uh, all items have either received a public hearing in council, uh, sorry, in committee already, or they will receive a public hearing here. Items that have not yet had a public hearing, your card will automatically trigger that. If there's been a public hearing in committee, it requires a council member to reopen the public hearing to hear that. And finally, there's a period for our meeting called general public comment, which is for items not on our agenda, but nevertheless under the jurisdiction of the city council. Um, and that is two minutes per speaker. Again, just fill out a speaker card, hand that to one of the sergeants at arms, and we'll be sure to hear your general public comments. That's for items that uh, are before us, um, sorry, that are not before us, but nevertheless under our jurisdiction. Uh, so w thank you for your patience. This is a, a last quorum call for our uh, remaining members, Council Members Reyes, uh, Rosendahl, and Weiss. If you'll please make your way down, if the Sergeants at Arms can help us track down where those individuals are so we can begin our meeting. Thank you for your patience.
Hillis, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosnall, Smith, Weiss, Weston, Zine, Garcetti. Ten members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right, Mr. Cardenas moves and Ms. Gruel seconds. Without objection, uh, those will be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Ms. Hahn moves and Mr. LaBange seconds. Without objection, those will be approved as well. Next order of business, please. Mr. President, this is Tuesday and there's a flag salute. Okay. If I can ask everybody, please rise for a pledge of allegiance and Ms. Hahn in your... Resplendent Green, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Please join with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Ms. Hahn. Uh, if we can run through the agenda, please. On the regular agenda, item one, nothing has been received from the mayor's office, therefore no action is required today. Okay. Next item, please. Items two through four, items to which public hearings have been held. All righty. Anybody wishing to call two through four special? Yes, Ms. Hahn. Uh, item four, please. Four for Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Cardenas. And uh, two is linked to 18, is that correct? Okay. Anybody wishing to call two special? No, no specials for two or three? And we'll go ahead. Uh, we, we, uh, we do expect a 12th member, so why don't we hold the ordinance until we have 12 members. And please open the roll on number three. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next items, please. Items 5 through 16 are items to which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, let's hold five and six until uh, we have uh, Mr. Reyes here. Um, uh, oh, Mr. Reyes is here. My apologies. Just look in the chart. However, so Mr. President, there are cards on both those items. Okay, we'll call both of the special. Mr. Reyes? Yeah, five. Five. Thanks. Okay, number, got him. We'll call it special for you as well. Um, let's go back, actually, to item number two, if nobody wanted to call that special. Um, and now that we have uh, Mr. Reyes? Item 13 for one week. Yes, we'll continue 13 for one week, um, but... We have item number two now before us. If nobody wishes to be heard on that, let's prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Um, back on five through 16. We'll continue 13 for one week till the ninth without objection. And any other specials, colleagues? Do we have uh, cards in the public, Mr. Clerk, on any case? Yes, Mr. President. On item nine, mm -hmm. 11, yep. and 16. Okay. We'll open and close the other public hearings. Uh, yes, Mr. City Attorney. There's been discussions on number eight and nine regarding possible amending language. So okay. If those we'll call the special. That leaves us seven, ten, twelve, fourteen, and fifteen. Mr. Mr. President, there is a card on twelve as well. Okay, card on twelve. Mr. Lamont. Oh, uh, City Attorney, I couldn't hear, understand it. Okay. If there's no other specials. Let's take up seven, ten, fourteen, and fifteen, please. Prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. Those are approved. Next item. On the continuation agenda, item 17 is an item for which public hearing has been held. Okay. Anybody wishing to call 17 special? Ms. Gruel. If we can call the roll then for the special meeting, please. Alicon Cardenas, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosenthal, Smith, Weiss, Wesson, Zahn, Garcetti, 12 members present, and a quorum. Mr. President. Okay. We have uh, one item, number it 18. This is a one item agenda. Item 18 is an item for which public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. There is a card on that. Okay. We'll call that special for a card from the public, and we will uh, temporarily uh, recess that meeting and head back to the regular meeting. That will take us to our general public comments right now. This is for items that are not on the agenda, but nevertheless under the jurisdiction of the city. Sean Murphy is our first speaker here in Council Chambers. Good morning, Mr. Murphy. Good morning, Madam President, City Council. I'd like to thank the mayor f for standing up for, against fare increase. I'd like to thank you, Mayor, f for not raising the bus fares. The bus riders in, in the L.A. have a break. I want to thank you, Mayor. But I don't thank Arnold Schwarzenegger for cutting summer school programs and other services. Shame on you, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You ought to be recalled. A lot of people are upset. A lot of people are upset at you, Arnold Schwarzenegger, at you, Governor, and you should be recalled. Our next speaker is in Van Nuys. It's Bruce Darian. Good morning. 
Morning, City Council members and President Garcetti. Last week I spoke about the uh, Malibu Pier debacle and uh, the state cover-up. And the uh, Assistant City Attorney now has interjected many times saying it has nothing to do with city business. I'd like to, my time to be hold right, held right now, and I'd like the City Attorney, Assistant City Attorney, to explain to the Council why it is not city business. Then I'll use my time to rebut that. Please go forward. Sorry, sir, we can't uh, respond right now, but if you'd like to, please continue. You have two minutes, a minute and a half left. Okay. Well, in the future, I'd appreciate it if he's not going to publicly, for the record, address why it is not city business, that he does not interject in my public comment. This has happened many times. I'm willing on, on the air here to listen to his comments and address them before the people of Los Angeles. Uh, but to be continually interrupted on a, a regular basis is inappropriate. And I ask that the council from now on, when the city attorney does interrupt people, specifically address why it is not city business. That way the people can understand it and the person has an opportunity to respond. The Malibu Pier debacle is not about only building the Malibu Pier, but it's about government fraud. And it encompasses Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, the state of California, the city of Malibu, and across the board. Many of the lucrative contracts and restaurants and, and construction contracts involve deals that are done behind the scenes. What happens is the public gets less than what it bargains for and is cheated out of those services or products that it is paying for out of the public's coffers. This is very important. It's, been, it's as old as the hills, but it needs to stop because the people in Los Angeles can no longer bear the burden of these fraudulent contracts. I've come before the people of Los Angeles for, for 10 years now. I've been in court and litigation for nine solid years. It's a long time. And it's astounding to see the network of and conspiracy of silence that goes on here. There'll be more to come. Thank you. Our next speaker is also in Van Nuys. It's Matt Dowd, and after that is Zuma Dog. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Channel 35, Matt Dowd. You're wondering why I keep coming back to City Hall for public comment? It's because the people of Los Angeles are getting screwed over by the city government, specifically this city council right here. Their approvals of ordinances and exemptions and variations and all the development, the, the, the pension fund commissioners, the mayor... It's cost seven, eight billion dollars when you, when you count the budget deficit. So if you're wondering why you're getting a lot of tickets and you're getting a lot of tr uh, uh, fees, increases, trash collection fees, all these things, because the mayor's not on the job. It's documented he was never on the job. The city council's not on the job. Jack Weiss in particular was not on the job. And this, the voters have spoken. It's our greatest victory. I was ready to quit. If Jack Weiss didn't get beaten, I was going to quit public comment, never going to come back ever again. Because I didn't think you could beat the money, the pay to play, the Villaragosa money, the back the school board, LAUSD, they ripped all the money out of the school budget now too. Still getting harassed down at Venice Beach. So everything comes back to that. And here's the biggest problem is this city council will not take a leaf out of the Obama book, even though the council president, Eric Garcetti, the biggest violator of the Brown Act and the First Amendment, wouldn't reach out if, you know, if he, he wouldn't even reach out to me if he was drowning in a, in a raging river down the L.A. River. And I was, oh, okay, Eric, come on. He'd probably say, no, you're Matt Dowd. That's how I feel. That's why you get what you get. And it's going to keep coming until someone reaches out and ends the... Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Our next speaker is Zuma Dog. Yeah, I, I swear I wasn't coming here today. Today's public comment brought to you by Peggy Thusing. And LAPD has a lot of great cops. Peggy Thusing is not one of them. And I hope Council Member Bill Rosendahl talks to Peggy Thusing. Because when my friends are getting stabbed... And when my friends are getting shot, killed on the streets, I think LAPD Peggy Thusing should have better things to do than to write Matt Dowd a ticket for riding a bicycle. 
I don't care. It was a bicycle, and it was Matt Dowd, and she's got a history of harassment. And I hope Bill Rosendahl, hey, you know what? Let's talk about Mayor Villaraigosa. First of all, he's lost juice at MTA. He couldn't get the runway lighting contracts, and that was quite a sign. And I'd like the people to know that the city experts of pension up here last week, and thank you, Dennis Zine and Bernard Parks, said the mayor has too much power and authority with his pension commissioners. He's got four or five commissioners, and they lost $7 billion, and I got other things to talk about. Go to LADailyBlog.com. You can read more. My blog's got currently the number one story in the state today, as it does every day. My blog's on fire, people. And we got an opportunity to take back the city, CD2. Uh, city Council, it starts in July, the election, and uh, you know what? <laughs> I don't want to become a council member. Why would I want to become such a despicable thing I despise so much that does so much bad and damage and hurts people? And, and I don't know, but, but t -t 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 I might have to take back the seat. So let's talk about that. And First Amendment. You say we have freedom of speech. A message to City Attorney Dion O'Connell for City Council to get him. Carmen Trutonich wants compliance hey he's going too far cut you know if the city council doesn't like what we are saying now what they do is they cut you off they will remove you they will arrest you it is a cowardly act it is illegal steve cooley doesn't want it zuma dog doesn't want it it's stopping thank you mr dog and thank you for those two minutes of free speech there karen bonadio is our next speaker here in council chambers after that is stephen box Good morning. How do I, how do I follow that? <laughs> it's tough, but go ahead. Don't worry. <laughs> good to anyway, see you. Anyway, good morning. I'm good here morning. to talk about the. Okay, you guys, listen, please. This is very important, and it's not about elephants. I'm here to talk about the overseas military vote. How many in this room, and anybody watching at home, how many of you realize that one in four of our overseas military votes were never counted in the 2008 presidential election? This is appalling. Uh, these brave young men and women put their lives on the line for all of us, for our freedom and the freedom of people all over the world, yet they have no say in our government. So what I'd like to say today is I'd like to introduce to you the two new bills that have been proposed in the House and the Senate. I'm going to give you these, and I want people like Mr. Rosendahl to write it down. This is the House Bill 2393. Again, the House Bill 2393. Senate Bill is 1026. Again, Senate Bill 1026. It now takes three weeks for the overseas military vote to be counted. These two bills, which are bipartisan, will actually make it a mandatory four days for our military's votes to be counted. Please, I'm asking all of you, support this. Call your congressmen, call your senators. What you need to do is ask to speak to the staff person who handles the military voting issues. This is important, all of you, because I know that you'd appreciate it when you were running for your office for city council. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. Your next speaker is Stephen Box, and after that is Olga Hall. Yesterday was a bad day for the city of Los Angeles and especially for cyclists, for pedestrians, and for those that use mass transit. At midday, a woman on Louise in the Valley was killed when she was hit by a truck operated by a DWP contractor, pronounced dead at the scene. On Pacific Avenue, a pedestrian stepped into the crosswalk and was hit by a bus and drug for two blocks before the bus operator was flagged down and notified that there was a body under his bus. That person was also pronounced dead at the scene. And in, on Van Noen, a motorist plowed into a bus stop taking four women, one of whom was trapped under the car. Local residents lifted the car and freed the woman. So you've heard me say before that our streets are uh, congested, they're moving fast, and they're dangerous for everybody. I can't expect the city of Los Angeles to address the driving skills of all those who operate vehicles on the streets of L.A., 
but I do believe you're in a position to require those who operate city-owned vehicles or city-contracted vehicles to take a simple driving course that stresses the rights of pedestrians and cyclists on the streets of L.A. If we're to set a safety standard for our streets and all those that operate on them, it's imperative we start with those over whom we have the most control, those who are on the payroll of the City of Los Angeles. Keep in mind that if an employee of the City of Los Angeles operates a bicycle, we require them to take a special course on riding a bicycle. But when it comes to operating a car, I'm calling on you to implement a training program to ensure that any city employee or contractor be required to successfully complete a course for motor vehicle operators on safety for pedestrians and cyclists. These courses are in place. All that's missing is the political will to make it a reality. I thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Olga Hall is our next speaker. After that is Walter Bechtel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, members of the council. Good morning, Mr. President. I want to show you the picture of the Southwest Museum. This is what is at stake in the ne next week. It will come to the Board of Refer Powers. This is what we need to put in our minds that is worth saving. It's worth saving. It's history. It's all for the division of Charles Loomis. Today, I had an experience. I was coming to this uh, meeting, and I used the metro. And there was a group of children that uh, were on a field trip coming to see uh, Union Station, um, Olvera Street. The Southwest Museum is right, has a station right at its feet. It shows you how important right now is to have the Southwest Museum open because it's the perfect place, the perfect transportation. It can touch thousands and thousands of kids, visitors, is the perfect place and it's in your conscience to save it. You are saving the legacy of Los Angeles. You have to protect it. Not a special interest as Jackie Autry's greed. That's not what you are here for. You are here to be ethical to have a heart to govern with conscience, to govern for the people. Please, keep it in mind, this is what you're saving. Thank you. Our next speaker is Walter Bechtel. After that is Miriam Fogler, back out in Van Nuys. Good morning, Mr. Bechtel. Um, thank you. You know, somebody came to, to talk to me last Friday about a problem at the Ford Hotel, except for uh, instead of her emailing me like she told me she was going to, we had two more, two showers shut down. They're supposedly going to fix them. You know, I went to Kmart, and the shower heads that I'm talking about that should be on the showers only cost $3.50. Uh, instead, what they're doing is putting these little thimble things on with holes poked into them into the shower heads, so hardly any water comes out at all. Why are we being uh, accused of wasting water at the Ford Hotel? There's only about 140 of us. None of us have lawns. None of us have uh, kitchens and, and, and giant bathrooms and, and water beds, etc. Uh, why are we always the, uh, the scapegoat for what the other people of the city are doing, watering uh, sidewalks and trying to see what they can grow between the cracks? You know, if you, if you can't convert the hotel to the 140-unit hotel you claim to do with kitchenettes and full baths, etc., uh, that's going to be more waste of water, but as it is, we're hardly wasting any water I, I don't understand. What, 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 are, what are you thinking here? The, the, the people that are, are wasting the, the water and the time are the management and the engineering people who, who don't understand 
uh, how to to uh, configure the situation here. I don't think we have a, a water problem. We have a, a management problem in the city. People don't know how to uh, design what's going on. Uh, so I, I don't think that we should keep on being punished for what the, the rest of everybody else is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Miriam Fogler in Van Nuys. After that is Glenn Bailey. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I like to I like to be able to tell you that on the last contract that the city employees had, they only had a six percent increase over five years, and I'm even thinking about foregoing the next one, the next five year contract. But we need this raises that we can forego any raises on the next one, just keep it the way it is. But uh, uh, what you need to do here is to be uh, open and understanding about the plight of people who who will uh, be working and you're laying them off, and the mayor's got the audacity to want to run for mayor, I mean governor. He's got some nerve, because uh, I like to recall him. I like to have the petition that... Uh, that John Walsh had here the other day. I'd like to get a hold of that. So if you can get me that petition down here, I would appreciate John and uh, Leonard. The early retirement program would save the city lots of money. But on the other hand, you said they need the experienced workers, so they need to understand that they can't uh, go in and expect to get uh, good service and get and give cheap uh, pay. You've got to pay for what you want to get. Uh, if you don't want to pay people enough money, you're going to get lousy service folks and may not even get services at all because that's what they want to do is lay people off and put people on furloughs so you, the public gets screwed because made sure that a uh, public, uh, public employee who retired here at the LEU of high school district for 30 years got his way that uh, now he's not showing up and he knows that, that he did wrong he's a hypocrite and he, he, he doing out of revenge for three, in, three of his members family and uh, I don't condone the kind of behavior that he got for special privilege with you, Mr. President, or Garcetti, sit here over here on a day you were down here in the valley to speak for 15 minutes privately with him, but you wouldn't give me the, the 15 minutes too. So I asked you for that, and you just walked away from me. You're very rude to me, Mr. Gar Gar Garcetti. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your comments today. Uh, Glenn Bailey is our next speaker. Council members, I stand before you sadly the morning after a 30-year-old woman was uh, riding, killed riding her bicycle in Lake Balboa on Louise Avenue at Valerio, apparently crushed to death by a Department of Water and Power contracted vehicle carrying telephone poles in a residential neighborhood. And, you know, they say, wear a bicycle helmet, you'll be okay, you'll be protected. I'm sorry, a bicycle helmet is not going to protect anybody, bicyclist, pedestrian, from the DWP truck carrying those telephone poles. I hope that once she's been identified that this council will, at the very minimum, adjourn in her memory. And I hope that if it is, in fact, the fault of the city's DWP driver or contractor, that I hope that her heirs will get much more than the firefighter that ate dog food. Now, having said this, this, this underscores the point that the city's revising its bicycle master plan as we speak. And I, we just received a meet and email, that is if you're on a neighborhood council, advising the fact that the maps are now, now out at the regional public libraries. Why aren't they out at all public libraries? And why weren't the hundreds of people that attended the workshops last year notified of the availability of these maps? And why wasn't the city's own bicycle advisory committee notified of the, of the availability of these maps? I think that there needs to be a great deal of improvement with regards to outreach if you truly want to have a meaningful public input in having a city bicycle plan that will address examples such as what we can hopefully try to prevent from, that occurred yesterday in Lake Balboa. Thank you very much, sir. That will close our general public comment. Um, if we can take up uh, item number four, please. And that was called special by Ms. Hahn. Ms. Hahn, item number four. 
Okay. I, I hear you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, this item is the uh, 245. Uh, item before us, and uh, I was the one that introduced a motion to assert jurisdiction over the Port Master Plan Amendment, which is related to the Channel Deepening Project, um, which I want to be very clear to everyone that I completely support deepening the main channel of the Port of Los Angeles in a timely way. We know uh, that that makes our port competitive. Uh, we know that that uh, ensures uh, the future of good paying jobs uh, on the docks. Uh, so I know how important that project is. Uh, and uh, I will tell you in the last uh, week there's been a lot of misinformation uh, out there and there was some uh, misconception uh, that I was trying to hold this project up and in no way uh, was I trying to hold this project up but as you know colleagues it's our obligation and responsibility to ask questions uh, particularly about a hundred million dollar uh, project that has uh, long-term impacts uh, so when I first weighed in on this channel deepening project uh, in January um, one of the things that I raised a concern about was, uh, you know, when you dredge the channel like that, you have to put the dirt somewhere. And one of the locations that uh, the Port of Los Angeles has identified as a place to dump uh, clean as well as toxic dirt uh, was the old Southwest Marine Terminal, which has the last two uh, operational boat slips in our harbor. And there was um, a concern from the business community, from uh, the, com the community in San Pedro and Wilmington, from longtime workers who remember when we had a shipyard at the Port of Los Angeles. And so many people began to dream of the day uh, when we might bring a shipyard back to the Port of Los Angeles and bring back the kinds of jobs that we used to have when we lost Todd Shipyard. Uh, and as we know now, revenues are down at the port uh, because most of our interest is in containers and is in the jobs that are directly related to loading and unloading containers. And wouldn't this be an opportunity to diversify the jobs out the port and maybe make an opportunity for a shipyard in the future. So by dumping this dirt and closing off this possibility, some of us just raised questions on whether or not we could do both. Dredge the channel, dump this dirt, but maybe preserve this future possibility of bringing back uh, a first-rate a uh, world-class shipyard repair and building facility. Um, that's all I wanted. I wanted to ask the question, is that possible? Could we not close the door um, to the potential of a shipyard at the Port of Los Angeles? So last week in Trade, Commerce and Tourism, Tom Abanj and I uh, asked those questions and uh, as you know in the 245 process, the only way we could actually get those answers is to send it back to the Harbor Commission and say, is there a way that you can answer those questions for us here on the City Council? Uh, and I will say we've had a lot of good discussions, a lot of good debate, a lot of dialogue uh, with port staff, uh, with council staff, with community members, uh, with the uh, the company that actually is proposing to build a shipyard there. Uh, and last night at uh, about 6 o'clock, the Harbor Commission convened a special meeting uh, where they passed a board resolution that answered uh, the questions that I had raised and uh, looked to resolve some of those um, issues. So uh, with that, uh, I've introduced a, a substitute motion from what I did last week uh, that will basically um, approve the master plan amendment uh, with the clarifications that I asked for about uh, dumping the dirt while preserving the possibility of building a shipyard there. I've also asked uh, the Harbor Department I, to look at the feasibility of a shipyard before they fill those slips uh, with toxic dirt and uh, hopefully we've got a resolution. Uh, I don't think everybody's completely happy, but I will say this process, colleagues, 
has fostered a very interesting debate on the, on the possibility of bringing a shipyard back to America's port. Uh, and for that, I think it's been important, it's been useful, uh, and uh, I, I think we can um, continue to discuss about the future uses at the Port of Los Angeles. But I think at this point it would be right for us to approve this, to move this master plan forward to the Coastal Commission uh, and get this uh, channel deepening project moving ahead, which will create good jobs. I know some of my council members probably want to say a few things, but colleagues, there are some people that have showed up here today uh, to address us. If it would be okay, maybe you can reopen the public comment for about 10 minutes. Is that okay with everybody? Second. Okay. So why don't we have 10 minutes of public comment, uh, and then uh, if you have other questions or issues to to raise at this time, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. There's no objection to reopening public comment. We will. We have. Um, we count the cards real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Did you, Ms. Han? We have about uh, nine or ten. Do you want to do a minute apiece? Okay. All right. Uh, Robert White is our first uh, speaker. After that will be uh, Joel Clearwalker. Good morning. My name's uh, Mitch White. I'm a resident of San Pedro. Also work for a marine construction contractor in the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach. And I'm also here on behalf of the Associated General Contractors. I would just like to say that uh, we strongly support uh, the approval of the uh, Master Plan Amendment Number 24 without revision or exception to it. Uh, we think it creates jobs, uh, strong, high-paying jobs for longshoremen, for construction workers. It furthers a plan that has been in, in, in the works for the past four years between federal agencies. It's been approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. It's something that, that needs to be approved in order to, to complete a federal project, uh, several hundred million dollar project. Uh, we urge the, uh, the council to uh, I believe go with uh, Councilman Hans' uh, position now, which is to approve the motion, or I'm sorry, approve the uh, Port Commissioner's Master Plan Amendment Number 24. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joel Thermachter? Thermachter? Is that right? Excuse me. Can't quite tell what those middle letters are. Is it Thermachter? Thermachter. Thermachter. Thank you. Yes, sir. After that is Ben Resnick. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Joel Thurwalker. I'm a business representative for the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 12. Local 12 is in support of the approval for the Port Master Plan Amendment number, tw number 24 without modifications, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming down. Ben Resnick is our next speaker. After that is John uh, Bridewell. Ben Resnick. Uh, members of the Council, my name is uh, Ben Resnick with Jeffrey Mangles, Butler, and Marmoreau. I represent Gamble Industries. Uh, let me encapsulate for you what's before you, potentially, uh, if you look at the committee report. Uh, the Port of LA wants to dredge about 3 million cubic yards. No one's opposed to that. That's the channel deepening. Everyone is in favor of that. Of that 3 million cubic yards, only 80,000 cubic yards are contaminated. That's two and a half percent is contaminated. The proposal is to take that 80,000 cubic yards and put it into two of the last remaining large water slips that serve Southwest Marine historical, potentially historical site, which used to be a shipyard. The question before you is, is that a, a proper use or of these slips to forever destroy the water slips by filling them with contaminated dirt and then capping them with dirt such that they will never be available again in the future for any use of any shipyard Thank that you, is Mr. going to be of su substantial size. Thank you. John Bradwell is our next speaker. Bridwell. And then after that is Mary Jo Walker. On behalf of Gamble Industries and all of the local supporters of Southwest Marine Shipyard, I want to thank the City Council and especially Councilwoman Hahn 
for the time and effort in giving this your consideration. In January 07, Gamble submitted a letter to the Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles laying out our interest in revitalizing and restoring Southwest Marine to make it a modern, green, efficient shipyard. Thousands once worked there. We thought we could bring many jobs back. In February of 07, in a letter from the Executive Director, the Port acknowledged our interests and promised to consider our proposals and keep us informed. That never happened. In July of 2008, the port circulated a draft EIR for the channel deepening project. In that EIR, it was stated that it would distribute to all known interested parties. It was not distributed to Gamble Industries. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mary Jo Walker is next. After that is Luis Dominguez. Good morning, Council. Good morning. My name is Mary Jo Walker. I'm representing the San Pedro Bay Historical Society and also myself. We are not against deepening the channel. We know we need it done. We need jobs in San Pedro, the most important thing in the world. But we do not want historical shipyard being destroyed. And we also do not want to see tons of toxic dirt being piled across the main channel, right across from the Ports of Call restaurant, for the next 10 years. And you know that will happen. Just take a look at Todd's shipyard. What do we got down there? We got dirt piles with weeds growing out of it. We don't want that in San Pedro. There's other ways to take care of this toxic dirt. Do it the right way and not do it the wrong way. Thank you. Thank you. Luis Dominguez is our next speaker. And then Bob Stein. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Louis Dominguez. I'm representing myself. Uh, again, like everybody else, I believe the deepening of the port is very important. However, uh, being a longtime resident of uh, San Pedro, I've watched us lose 6,000 jobs at Todd Shipyard, thousands more jobs at the cannery, and no replacement for them. Uh, what I see, there's two major points that I am I'm upset about as far as this plan. Number one, it's a transfer of knowledge overseas. Pretty soon we won't have anybody in our port that even knows how to fix a ship. Uh, we need that capability. We're the only world-class port in the world that doesn't have the ability to fix even a tug, basically, in its own port. Uh, and as was mentioned before, Todd Shipyard, which was closed, they did the same thing. There was a pile of dirt there that has been up there for a long time. Uh, the people of San Pedro will be very upset if they see the same thing across from Ports of Call, the area that we are trying to beautify. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Stein is our next speaker. After that is Gary Tobin. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Bob Stein. Gamble, G-A-M-B-O-L, Industries. Thank gotcha. you very much. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank uh, you for your time today. Uh, the Port of uh, Los Angeles, the Port of Long Beach are the only two of the top 25 ports in the world that don't have shipyards. Enough said about that. I want to thank Janice Hahn for her uh, 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 assistance in, in starting the dialogue with the port. Uh, and uh, I'm optimistic that uh, uh, more can be done with that dialogue and hopefully we can reach a resolution to establish a, a world-class shipyard there and use these historical buildings and the slips that are associated with them to have a shipyard there. Uh, you can't have a, 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 a shipyard without slips. It's equivalent to having a kennel without pens. Uh, and I want to thank our supporters have, who have encouraged us to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gary Tobin is our next speaker. After that is Mike Bueller. Uh, president Garcetti and members of the uh, City Council, I'm Gary Tobin, President of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. It was the year 1889 that the LA Chamber first went to Washington, D.C. to lobby for the deepening of San Pedro Harbor so that we could create the Port of Los Angeles. That project was essential to our economy then, and this project is essential to our economy now. This is an Army Corps of Engineers administered project, and failure to meet their deadlines could put our funding at risk. If this project is delayed, other terminal projects that are already underway will be delayed, costing 
thousands of jobs and billions in infrastructure investment. They include TREPAC, use in terminals, and China shipping. In summary, nothing is more important for the Port of Los Angeles and the logistics industry of Southern California than moving forward on this project. We support the arrangement brokered by Commissioner Janice Hahn. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Bueller is our next speaker. Good morning. Good morning, members of the Council. Uh, Mike Bueller, Director of Advocacy for the Los Angeles Conservancy. The Conservancy has submitted a letter this morning detailing the significance of the Southwest Marine Shipyard as well as the slips in relation to maintaining the site's historic use. Um, in our letter, we have requested that the Council uh, take action to clarify the recommendation of the Harbor Commission adopted last night, which directs port staff to look at alternatives to filling in the slips at the shipyard. Um, we urge the Council to impose a deadline for completion of that analysis to ensure that it takes place before any construction activity takes place at the shipyard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zuma Dog and Van Nuys and then Matt Dowd. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got to bring a few things up. First of all, I saw in 2002 the Coastal Commission approved this. I'd like to say Coastal Commission's in the pocket of Weatherly Capital, Dan Weinstein, and involving uh, the Han name, uh, Janice's brother. So right away, I don't like this thing. Secondly, I heard Ben Resnick. Whenever I hear that name, I go, let me listen because then I'll know the other side of the issue to be on. So he's for this. Let me tell you what this is, people. <laughs> they, they, they want to take, okay, like, like, like as if the people in the port area don't get hammered enough with pollution, now they want to dump toxic waste into the water, remove slips of people that need them, just in the name of making a few more bucks. And I'll certainly be looking at who lobbied this into the campaign contributions of Janice Hahn, because my sources in the port tell me that if you need things done, you got to pay, ja I mean, oh no, I'm sorry that Janice gets extra. That's how it is. There's a lot of kickbacks in City Hall, IBEW, all these things. And so don't dump toxic waste in San Pedro. How's that? Matt Dowd is our next speaker, our last speaker on this. Yes, uh, it's very interesting that uh, Councilwoman Janice Hahn, you know, one, one day she's like, oh, Cabrillo Beach is disgusting, and we've got to do whatever it takes to clean up San Pedro. But then all of a sudden pressure comes from the commercial lobbyists, and oh no, let's dump 100,000 cubic yards of contaminated waste all over those slips. I've been in San Pedro, we went down on a fact-finding mission last week, you probably saw us on Channel 35. And uh, we went over to Terminal Island. We did. We looked around, and uh, San Pedro is a ghost town right now. And quite frankly, I know the ports do, do a lot of business for the country, but it's time to let some other cities take the weight of this burden. We don't have the infrastructure there. You're going to allow bigger container ships, more stock come into the, to that port, and then you're going to congest all the roads, getting it all out of there. There's no infrastructure. I'm Here's against it. That's our last speaker for the reopened public hearing. Um, Ms. Han, did you want to say anything before we went to Mr. Labange, or do you want to conclude? Okay. Mr. Labange is next, and then Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. May I also, before I make my remarks, welcome the third grade class from Temple Israel of Hollywood who are here. Stand up and back. Give them a big hand. Ms. Wasserman and Ms. Nusche. Thank you very much. Uh, Temple Israel is a very special place. That's where Big Sunday started on an idea by one person. Give Temple Israel a big hand again there. Thank you, third graders. Now, as the third grade class is here, I recall as a child uh, with my father going to San Pedro before the St. Vincent Thomas Bridge was built, as I call it, St. Vincent Thomas, because that's what Bobby De Niro called it in the movie Heat. But there was a very, very famous ferry that would go across to Pier Point Landing and all the places in Terminal Island. And then you'd see those real shipbuilders. You'd see those real people make a relationship to what the port was all about. And as Miss Hahn spoke of in her eloquent remarks, she talked about containerization and all of that. And also, uh, Mr. Stein, I believe, who spoke, if that's the correct name, uh, he talked about everything container. Real quick, we've got to make sure that of the top 25 
ports in the world, we absolutely have the, bill, the ability to try to build ships. That's real important. We don't offshore absolutely everything. So your efforts, Ms. Han, which was done at the fourth quarter, which was done right on the goal line, which turned it around to make available the opportunity for everybody to score in the future. I know you hate football analogies, but I wanted to drive in the point that you made a big difference here and call into attention to the committee and to the council that there could be an opportunity for a solution. And the people of San Pedro who came down uh, to voice their uh, concerns and Louie, uh, as I said that correctly, who did such a great job, as you mentioned, on the uh, lights uh, of the St. Vincent Thomas Bridge. Uh, Louis, thank you for your work there. It is an opportunity. I think the people of the Port of Los Angeles have a mission, and their mission is to try to do what's best uh, for uh, Los Angeles and Southern California. With that mission as well, we've got to not forget the past and to have the opportunity to create uh, potential shipbuildings activity here as we go forward. So you did uh, intercept the ball maybe in the goal line, if I can say that, and you went 99 yards the other way to give an ability for everybody to score in this effort here. I'll teach you about that someday, Janice Hahn, but you taught us a lot about the port, and this is an opportunity to create an opportunity. This is an opportunity to create an opportunity, and that's the only thing that I want to say right now. I thank you for your leadership on this. I thank the Port of Los Angeles uh, having the ability to make a change and having a late night meeting last night uh, to come up with an opportunity to create an opportunity. And I uh, say it again, information is knowledge is power. You gave us the information, Janice, to give us the uh, knowledge to make the right decision for the power of the future to the Port of Los Angeles. An opportunity for an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. LaBanche. And just as a point of information, you have one more football analogy left for this fiscal year. So we can do that. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Ms. Hahn. Thank you for your leadership on the port. Since I've been on this council for four years, we've had the pleasure of serving together on the committee uh, where you are chair of, and the harbor is something you have taken such an interest in that I've seen more progress in that harbor in the last four years thanks to your leadership. So bless you, and hats off to you and your leadership. I have one big question, though, and I'd like uh, somebody from the port to come on up for this. We have staff in the port here. Okay, come on up, right up to the table. Here's the big question, okay? Obviously, we want to dredge that port. We want to make it the best port on the planet. Uh, and uh, when Bob Wagner calls me and tells me there's jobs, I listen. When David Frieden calls me and tells me it's a necessary ecological thing, obviously, I listen. But when the location managers call me and the entertainment industry who do a lot of shoots in one of those locations, I listen to them too. What's going to happen with the location manager's location that they do a lot of filming in? Uh, Councilman Rosendahl, uh, it's a very good question. and uh, We have taken uh, control over the management of the filming at the Southwest Marine Shipyard uh, within the Harbor Department. So we're now doing that in conjunction with Film LA with our own forces and we're open for business. So anyone who needs or wants to use that facility is a, uh, has access to it and it is available. The action in front of you, Councilman, on the um, channel deepening does not impact the Southwest Marine facility itself. Great. So that's open for business. That's perfect. That's the answer I was hoping to hear from you. So it's a win-win-win for everybody. Obviously we want to create jobs. Obviously we want to deepen the, the, the harbor, and obviously we want to keep uh, filming in Los Angeles, and we need that location. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, thank you, Ms. Hahn, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Rosenthal. Ms. Hahn, to conclude? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to follow up on that question, because that certainly is something we heard from Film LA, that they were very, very concerned about this. You mean even after uh, the, the uh, dredge material is uh, dumped at that site, it will still be uh, available for filming? Uh, yes, Councilwoman, the, um, uh, the future of the Southwest Marine uh, facility buildings um, is on a completely separate track from the channel deepening. So we will be uh, looking at what the ultimate long-term future of that facility is through a very public process completely separate from channel deepening. Right. Thank you, colleagues. Um, and again, I, uh, this was a um, opportunity to create an opportunity. And um, last week uh, on the Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee, we asked the Harbor Department to do two things. One, when they uh, 
when they dump the dirt at this location, they're actually creating land. Uh, so they have to create a zoning or designation for this land, uh, and they designated it as other. So we asked if they could clarify in their uh, board report that goes before the Coastal Commission that other did not preclude uh, the future of a shipyard at that location, uh, which they agreed to do. The second thing I asked for, was there a way to dredge the main channel, which we all support, uh, but was there a way to uh, use that uh, 283,000 cubic yards plus the 80,000 of toxic uh, at that location? Was there a way to dump it there without filling the slips? Uh, so they came back last night at their board with two actions. One, that um, they agreed that other uh, would not preclude the future of a shipyard uh, at this location, and they have language that uh, talks about um, examining the possibility of filling less than eight acres uh, at that site, at birth. 243 to 245, which were uh, the slips that we talked about remaining at the harbor. So today, what I would ask my colleagues to do is to affirm the action taken by the Board of Harbor Commission uh, Commissioners at their meeting held April 29th, approving this Master Plan Amendment 24, um, and also we would like to instruct the Harbor Department to study the feasibility for shipyard use before uh, these slips at berths 243 to 245 are filled. And colleagues, this was just a very reasonable uh, request of the Harbor Department. No one's against the main channel dredging project. Uh, everybody understands how important this is to the future of commerce and trade uh, at America's port. Uh, but we just felt, many people felt like, Many people from the business community, many people from the buildings trades uh, who represent workers who would build ships and repair ships, uh, many people from the community thought that it was a shame, a crying shame, to dump this dirt at a location which could be uh, used in the future to bring back diversity of jobs at this port. So it's been a very interesting discussion. It's had, we've had good dialogue, and I think it was an opportunity to create an opportunity, as Tom LaVange uh, said, and that's what is before you today. I ask for your unanimous support. Thank you. Uh, that will close our council comments on this. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the next item called special. Item 5 called special by Council Member Reyes, and there are cards on that. Okay, Mr. Reyes, uh, we'll take the cards first. On uh, item number 5, Stephen Box is our first speaker. After that is Matt Dowd in Van Nuys. Is Mr. Box here? Stephen? All right, we'll hold that for a second. Mr. Dowd in Van Nuys. First of all, point of clarification, Janice Hahn said everybody's for the deepening. I just said we're on item not. number five right now, which is regarding the city's bicycle licensing just, program. Thank you. Okay, well, let me uh, relate. I just don't like mistruths, and this is one. Item five. Okay, so the city repealing one of its ridiculous, most outdated ordinances on the books. One of my pet topics, repealing ordinances. But you know what, Tom LeBonge, this is his pet puppy, this one. Making you have registration on your bicycle. Yes, because poor little Tommy gets his bicycle stolen and oh yeah, let's call LAPD and everyone's got their bike registered so we can find the stolen bike. Like what a pipe dream. Like, you know, the, the, the... I didn't even want to make a football analogy, you know. Stop trying to be like Zuma Dog, making jokes, thinking everything's funny too. The city is not funny at this point. It's not a joke. It, the, the whole channel deepening, the bikes, the, the, the budget, it's not a joke. I know we're good performers and we're funny. People like us on TV. That's how you get ratings for this show. But now it's beyond ridiculous and that's why I get upset. Because you don't have your eye on the ball. 
So finally, some members of the public got up and made you do this after the, the, the bicyclists went on a, on a tour downtown and got stopped by the police. They wrote them all tickets for not having registration on the bike. The city is in such a financial hole right now. Bernie Parks will tell you how this is ridiculous and about time you repealed this one. So I want to shout out to all the bike people. It's a massive victory because they actually did something for you without you having to sue them. But it probably are lawsuits, but hey. I'll let someone next speaker else is Glenn Bailey, also in Van Nuys. Good morning. Good morning, council members. Uh, I am speaking this time as the chair of the City of Los Angeles Bicycle Advisory Committee, which has taken a position in favor of repeal of the Bicycle License Ordinance. And uh, I'll just tell you a few um, observations of mine, uh, being a lifelong Angelino. Um, from my childhood, I've had uh, probably a half dozen bicycles stolen all of which had a city license during that time period. Never, ever was there ever recovery made or any communication made. And, uh, and also when I tried to update the information due to a change of phone number or address, uh, it was not possible to do that under the current system. Um, and of course, this is in a city where when one has a car stolen, you can't expect to get uh, communication back except the one I got that says, please notify us if you found your car. I thought that was their job. So this uh, bicycle license ordinance is either not being enforced either because of the unwillingness or, or inability of police department, the finance department, um, and I guess there's not enough money into it, and yet other cities, in, following the same state law, other cities in, Calif in Southern California, including one of 40,000 population, charges $1 for the, your lifetime. You can register your, via your bicycle seven days a week, and they keep, their, keep the records in the database and update it. It's amazing that a city of this size can't serve the same public that other cities are able to do. So since you've failed, since everyone associated with has failed, please repeal this ordinance. There are private bicycle national groups that do the same service. It wouldn't cost you a penny. Thank you. Stephen Box is returned. We'll hear from him next here in Council Chambers. Good morning again. Good morning, Stephen Box. Um, it's a great, great day to see the uh, bicycle law on the brink of being repealed. I'd just like to point out that this is one of many laws that can be used um, when we're looking for an opportunity to ticket a cyclist. For example, bicycle pedals. There are still laws that regulate specific bicycle pedals. If you want to get down to it, we still have a law saying that hurdy-gurdies are illegal in the city of Los Angeles. So there are abundant opportunities to address the equipment of cyclists. If they haven't indeed broken the law, uh, sometimes they find themselves taking a ticket for the brakes. In other words, our equipment has exceeded the antiquated laws that govern cycling in the city of Los Angeles. So perhaps this is a time to review the law as it governs cyclists from beginning to end and also to take a look at communicating those laws and the application of those laws to all agencies involved. So this is perhaps the tip of the iceberg. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that will close uh, our public comment. Um, we have Ms. Gruel, Mr. Reyes, Mr. Zayn, Mr. Rosendahl, and Mr. Labanz. It was called special by Mr. Reyes, but under council, okay, under council rules it would go to the, the chair, but it went to go. Mr. Reyes first, go ahead. Go ahead, and then we'll take Ms. Gruel second. Well, thank you, Council President. Uh, thank you, the Chair of Transportation Committee, Council Member Gruel, for this courtesy. Uh, colleagues, as a maker of the motion, I am supportive of eliminating the bicycle licensing program it is ineffective and does not send the proper message that we support bicyclists in our city. I'd like to thank all the advocates who have taken time to come to City Council and make us aware of the day-to-day -day challenges of riding a bicycle in Los Angeles. My goal is to make this city the more, the, the more bike-friendly for everyone, from those who ride for recreation to those who are transit-dependent who rely on the bicycle as a primary source of transportation. 
I know some of my colleagues, including myself, are still concerned with bicycle safety. I strongly believe that licensing program did not promote safety in the manner in which it is intended and needed. I would like to continue to work with the police department, DOT, and advocate groups to enhance training and education among our police officers and cyclists that promote safety in our streets. I would like to have the staff from the uh, department uh, that's working on this just come to the table. I'd like to thank Mr. Glenn Bailey for his work uh, in the committee working with the bicycle advocates. Uh, given the number of demands on the limited staff that you have, do you see yourself working with the police department, perhaps the planning department, and trying to figure out some of the uh, policies that we need to implement that enhance safety? Is that a dialogue that we can commence, or is that a dialogue that's already started? Please hold my time. We, ha we have been working, uh, Michelle Mallory, Department of Transportation and the City's Bicycle Coordinator. We have been working on safety education programs over the years. We continue to, to support and uh, have contract staff with the Safe Moves to do children's education. There's certainly an opportunity to do more, but you're absolutely right. We're short of staff. And the new bicycle plan does talk about safety very specifically in the policy document. We actually hope to have that available to, public in, to the public in the next few weeks and we'll break down several programs and several goals for the city regarding safety. When the document's released and when council um, chooses to adopt the document, we actually we hope they'll adopt the document, we may want to look at some of the key elements within that and decide how best to move forward. I do know very specifically that there was an item within the policy document that talked about uh, education program with officers. So that's, I think, a critical step. The role of the LAPD in their infrastructure. Is there a unit in there? Is there a captain or a person, a decision maker within the, within the ranks of the LAPD that's involved to the level I think we need to be? We, it's very difficult for me to speak to LAPD. They have a number of issues to deal with, and I know there's LAPD staff here that may want to talk specifically about that. But there are, there is tra LAPD training. We have worked with them in the past to develop our officer education program that deals with bicyclist laws and rights and rules. And we could continue to work with LAPD training to um, expand the program that we have, build upon it, and maybe develop it into statewide uh, peace officer safety training, which is one of the goals of the state. As a follow-up, um, we'll work on a motion to get a report back on how your department, DOT, is working with LAPD. I know there have been several motions uh, dealing with the safety issue since it's come to light. Uh, and I want to put Harry on the spot and bring him to the floor, but I do know that we have a commitment from, one of, um, from the command staff. I'd like to formalize and understand how it is that the LAPD is actually dealing with these policies and how we're implementing them so that we are not, uh, it's not an us versus them mentality, but one in which we're building up a safety program where everyone can benefit and deal with the challenges we have in a city as big as Los Angeles. But thank you for your help and your support. I ask for an vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Uh, Ms. Gruel is next and then Mr. Zine. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Reyes, for your for leadership on this issue. And I think uh, sometimes we find that laws that were developed had a good reason to um, be implemented many decades ago um, are no longer needed and necessary. And there are options available. I know the question had been before about kids on bikes, and there are a number of organizations that do register um, those bicycles and the kids so that if there's anything that happens, they would be able to find that out. Um, and I think that is an opportunity that each individual parent should take responsibility for, and if you are a bike owner as well. Uh, but I think this uh, is a um, has been a problem within the uh, current system. Uh, whether LAPD, uh, you know, some using it effectively, others not using it effectively. If it really is necessary, and I know Mr. Zion is going to speak next. He can tell us about um, his experiences there. But I think uh, we want to encourage uh, bicycle riding. We want to encourage uh, people uh, getting out of their cars um, and to be able to participate. In this. And this was a, a barrier and a problem. And so for the advocates that are here and those that are in the San Fernando Valley, I want to thank them. Um, and I think this council has become uh, very attuned to the needs um, of the, the bicycle community.
community here in Los Angeles and also to the challenges that we face. And um, I know that we are going to, um, I'm pushing very hard to have um, at least a first hearing in the next month on the, the master plan and the bicycle plan to have a discussion. Um, is it perfect yet? I don't think so. I think our people are still talking about it, but let's begin that dialogue. Uh, we don't need to have the perfect uh, document, and I know DOT has moved quickly on that, and I've talked to Gail Goldberg because it was in planning department to get it out of planning department and get it out to the public to say what do we think about this um, and to be able to massage that. Um, it is necessary as we move forward on a lot of decisions in LA about traffic and transportation and about development and implementation of uh, many of the laws that we have already passed. Um, and so this is an ordinance. It's uh, we have heard it before. We've adopted um, moving forward in, in not having these licenses, uh, but this is actually just the first consideration of the uh, ordinance that we had asked uh, the city attorney to put forward. Uh, so some of you may think this is Groundhog Day because we've been talking about it, um, but this will be the, the first reading, and I believe if we have a unanimous vote of the 12 members today, it will be adopted on its first reading. Mr. City Attorney, is that correct? Um, Yes, okay. So uh, we hope that that will happen today um, and that we continue to work with the, the, the Bicycle uh, Coalition, the city's um, uh, committee, and others to ensure that we create an environment in Los Angeles that says we appreciate bicyclists, uh, we want to encourage uh, bicyclists, and we're going to make it easy for you to uh, maneuver in Los Angeles in a safe, uh, safe manner. So thank you very much, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. Mr. Zion is our next speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I have mixed feelings on this. I hear about the uh, accidents, the people who are getting struck by cars on bicycles, and just imagine a little kid doesn't have identification, because most little kids don't have identification, and they're struck by a car, they're knocked unconscious, the paramedics arrive, someone needs to notify the parents. When I was with the LAPD, we would look at the bicycle license, we'd be able to track that down and notify the parents. It was a successful way. We didn't have the number of bicycles, didn't have the population. However, we have a system in place by outside agencies where people can get that license. And I think it's critical for parents especially to make sure they have a license on the bicycle because very few kids carry identification. And without that identification, law enforcement, paramedics, hospitals don't know how to make a notification to the parent. So while I'm reluctantly supporting this because the police department hasn't been very successful in continuing the licensing, and it used to be the explorers would do it on Saturday at the police stations, licenses were a couple dollars, you could sometimes, I think, buy them at a bicycle shop. Uh, I, when my LAPD days, did recover some stolen bicycles by checking out the number. So there was some success, not as much success as should be. However, I don't think the police department is capable at this stage of resurrecting a program that would be effective in doing this. But caution to parents, if you have a youngster riding a bicycle and they don't carry identification, get a license and you can get one from some of the national organizations. And when we discussed this previous, it was discussed where you can get those. You can get them online. So that way your emergency personnel will be able to make a notification in the event of a tragedy. And that's the only way they'll be able to notify someone other than your loved one in a hospital waiting to make notification or going through a court and have a judge rule that the hospital can treat that individual. So there's a, there's a legal issue involved, and it's a lot easier to make a call to a parent, a lot easier to make a call to a relative uh, to come to a hospital for their loved one who's been struck by a bicycle. Because we have a lot of bicycles, we have a lot of bicycle accidents, we have a lot of people get injured on bicycles, and that's why the helmet law was put into place to do some help. Same with motorcycles. And motorcycle riders carry identification because they're required to have a driver's license. People are not required to have ID or they're riding a bicycle, and that's a concern. And with no identification, your emergency personnel do not know who to notify in the event of someone who's struck on a bicycle. So please avail yourself of a bicycle license that you can obtain, not from the city of L.A., or maybe other jurisdictions have them. I served on the Bicycle Advisory Committee many years ago. Uh, I was appointed by Tom Bradley many, many years ago to that with Alex Baum. So I remember how it's grown over the years, but as the popularity of bicycles has grown, the, the effect of the police department enforcement and licensing has really been dwindled to basically nothing. So we are today deciding again to discontinue that process of bicycle licensing in the city of LA, but still there's opportunity to get licenses from other entities, and I would suggest that parents who love their children take care of that so in event of a tragedy, event of an accident, they will be able to have notification to them. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Zion. Mr. Rosendahl is our next speaker. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, could I ask Michelle Kamano for a quick second? Uh, this came before our committee. As you all know, we had in Mandeville Canyon uh, a tragic situation that happened there. Uh, we had a full council chamber on this issue, and I raised the issue of the licensing and the process and why. And that in part brought us here today. Would you explain it a little bit to people watching this what we're doing here? This, the way bicycle licensing working, works in the state of California is the state through the California Vehicle Code allows local authorities to enact an ordinance to develop a bicycle licensing program. It still requires the city to buy the licenses or indicia as they're called from the state and then allows them through our ordinance allows the city to sell them to retailers and to LAPD who in turn sell them to the public. That cost us three dollars, they are good for three years, um, and then essentially you get a little pink slip, if you will, that it that says that this bicycle is yours, this is a serial number, and a, a copy of that pink slip goes to LAPD and they file it accordingly. In theory, the idea is that if a bicycle is stolen and that license is on there that you can find out who the owner is if they're injured or who the owner is if the bicycle is stolen. Um, unfortunately, LAPD doesn't have the resources at this time and it will take several hundred thousand dollars to bring the program back to where it should be if we do want to continue this program. Um, to electronically file the licenses in a manner and to make them accessible to, to the LAPD everyday cop on the street to be able to access that information. So in reality is it's been a tough law to enforce it, very much so. And what we have found through the research throughout the years is that most of the bike-friendly cities, Seattle, Portland, uh, San Francisco, Denver, have eliminated their licensing programs throughout the years as well. Mm -hmm. and, and also, just for the clarification, folks, that's why we did this, went through this process. Uh, I also, uh, as Ms. Greer was mentioning, I put in the Bicycle Bill of Rights. I did that after meeting with the group uh, and discussing it, and that is a work in progress. So where are we on that Bicycle Bill of Rights? S staff has submitted some information in a report responding to the number of items. Um, the CLA's office have it, and I believe that the city attorney, we're waiting for opinion back from the city attorney. Okay, great. Because I'm looking forward to that, having a robust discussion in the Transportation Committee and then obviously uh, before the full council. One of the problems we've had here in Los Angeles has been the car culture. And now we need to realize there's a lot of cultures here, including bicyclists. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of folks who take the bike to work every day. And there are a lot of other folks that, that enjoy it on weekends and, and when they're not working. And it is a healthy thing. And it's obviously a clean thing compared to exhaust of an automobile. Uh, we don't have our bike paths all together yet, do we? How much of the city do we now have bike paths? About 5% of the roadway network has a bikeway facility on it. The new plan will address a much greater number, and we're actually helping to, hoping to integrate them in a different fashion through the new plan. What's your sense of the timing of that plan? Well, a lot of it has to do with funding and staff availability. You know, it's a tough time to be introducing a brand new, really thorough master plan that allow us to implement it, and it's going to take money to do it. We're... Uh, the facilities break down into a number of types of facilities. We'll still be doing bike paths and bike lanes, and certainly our bike path projects are very costly, multi-million dollar projects. The LA River, for example. It will take us dozens of millions of dollars to complete the LA River and completely grade separated so we have a first class facility. So there is that. I think it will probably be on the order of 20 years to have something that resembles a, a complete network if we are able to implement the current plan. Okay, well I appreciate your candor on, on, on this subject uh, and I look forward to us continuing the discussion, especially uh, on the Bicycle Bill of Rights. Uh, this licensing thing, when we, uh, if we approve uh, going forward getting rid of it, um, we need to get the message out rather quickly. I got a call from a bicyclist yesterday who was stopped and didn't have a license and they made a big deal out of it. So we need to uh, go forthwith and implement it uh, with the LAPD so that uh, it's one last uh, issue that they need to deal with if we go that route. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. LeBond is our next speaker, our last speaker on the queue. Uh, say, uh, Detective Sergeant, uh, Harry, you know, were you falsely about that police department through your channels? Uh, what process we're taking today. Uh, I stand because many, many years ago, how many more years ago, Michelle, did we, you and I work on this? 17, 15? Before you were a council member, we started working on it about 15 years ago. Which was to try to implement it and get it, because I do hear what Mr. Zine says as far as the tool, but it becomes overwhelming, and it, I don't want to know, it becomes overwhelming whether it's obsolete. I think there is something. How many people in your position, in your department, are, uh, are there to do bicycle? matters. If you, uh, to 
to work on bicycle projects issues, yeah. About eight of us. Eight of us. And are any going to be cut because of the budget? It's my understanding that council has made a motion to exempt specially funded positions, which are positions, but yes, our positions were offered up. Oh, so, let me ask you a question, because I also represent horses in the city, and horses pay a tax. 100% of the horses tax, I get them to vote for me, Janice, 100% of the uh, uh, horse equine tax goes to horse issues. So my concept was, if we, 17 years ago and five years ago, but it has dissolved, if we did have some licensing program, if 100% went to bike programs, would that you be supportive of that, if it could be realized again? Well, it'd be certainly great to have more money. As I mentioned to Councilmember Rosenthal, we're going to need more funds to implement the projects within the new bicycle plan. The, the licensing fee currently does not... The revenue that would be generated by that would not cover the cost to implement the program. But if there was revenue, they're buying four thousand dollar bikes, or two thousand dollar bikes, or seven hundred dollar bikes, but I'm or sure we could three ninety nine, a hundred dollar bikes, or whatever it is. I'm just saying, members, I'm for repealing this. This is a repeal of an ordinance. We don't have to write an ordinance. We just got to repeal it, right, Mr. City Attorney? This ordinance will repeal the existing ordinance. You got to write it? Why can't you just say repeal it? Why you got to write it? It costs you money to write it. I want to save the city money. It has to be done by ordinance. Don't you can't to... just say repeal. That is correct. Can you write an ordinance that caused you to change the word to say repeal means repeal? You don't have to write it? <laughs> it, it has to be in writing. That's all how right. So he's got to do work on it. All right. So that all being said. The defensive uh, line is too strong there, I think. All right. Very good, Mr. Garcetti. That's why you're a Rhodes Scholar. I think that it's important on the roads of Los Angeles that we have a way to identify. So we have to look at alternatives, as Ms. Gruel spoke, as Mr. Reyes spoke, as Mr. Zion spoke, to inform children uh, of that because uh, we, uh, that's very important for children. And also, uh, the network that needs to be built is still ahead of us. It's a process. I want to thank you, Mr. Garcetti, for the, the first steps by King Middle School to create a safer bikeway on Myra Avenue between Santa Monica Boulevard and Fountain Avenue and your work in DOT, but Mr. Garcetti's uh, and his office created that opportunity. The bikeway down the river is so important that Mr. Reyes is pushing with Mr. Garcetti and has to come to be on this action here. But we, yes, we repeal it. Please inform the uh, Detective Sergeant Ito that we are repealing this or in the intent so no one has a consequence that they don't have. But I think we should come up with an alternative that would help us identify whether it's stolen property, whether it's injured person, what can be done, uh, and also find more funding for bicycle programs. My time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. That is our last speaker on the queue. Let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Uh, next item, please. Item six called special for cards. Okay, item number six is before us now. It's called special by cards in the public. And our first card is Zuma Dog and Van Nuys. This is turning into just like homework at school. I had all that time, and now I'm not prepared because I was doing other things. But we're talking about the uh, parking revenue fund, special parking revenue fund. And boy, do we need it, because let me tell you, people, the city's expecting parking revenues. $80 million of the budget is regarding parking revenues they expect to get. But zoom it, dog. I looked into my magic crystal ball. You ain't going to be getting those parking revenues. Now they got to come up with some kind of special parking fund. It looks shady as F, y'all. They want to transfer money. It says surplus fund transfers, all kinds of nonsense. So I'm just here to say, <laughs> there's, A, the mayor's budget, complete nonsense. This is part of it. Look what they have to do now complete smoke and mirrors. The city is in much worse shape than the budget says it's smoke and mirrors. Our next speaker is Matt Dowd, also in Van Nuys. Thank you for saying it so nicely, too. My name, because uh, Jam Perry doesn't. Yeah, this one, uh, I'll just take a minute on this. And, uh, yeah, what we're doing here, of course, the, the city's in the big budget hole that we talked about for weeks and weeks. So 
So there's a process where you can transfer parking revenue, obviously, into the general fund, and there's an ordinance, but they obviously didn't foresee anything coming, and now they've got to extend all the deadlines so we can get more money over. But let me tell you something. This parking is going to be a big, parking revenue is going to be a big issue because the city wants to try and sell our parking revenue. And so right now they're just trying to rip out some more money out of the surplus fund to try and cover the budget. And uh, it's still small potatoes and bankruptcy looms for the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. That will close public comment. Any members wishing to be heard? If not, let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved as well. Um, if we can go to the next item called special, please. Item 8 was being held on the desk, and there is an amending motion that has now been circulated. Okay. Without objection, we'll accept those as friendly amendments. Please prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved as well. Next item, please. Item 9 was called special for cards, and an amending motion has been circulated on this as well. Okay. Mr. Dowd, uh, you have a uh, card in on number 9, please. One, you have one minute left. Yeah, I'll waive consideration. Thank you. This okay, let's prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item 11, call special for cards. Okay, Donna Pearman is our first speaker, and then Miriam Fogler, also in Van Nuys. Very good morning. Have a comment. I told them to tell you two times. Excuse me, ma'am. Go ahead. I went to tell you on two times that oh. I never got to speak on public comment. I'm sorry, ma'am. We're, we're on number 11 right now. Donna. I know, but... God. Thank you. Darn it. Well, I'm... Excuse me. 11 at the same time. Sorry, we, the sound okay. is off. Um, no, that's the violation. And then we have I'm Miriam Fogler after that. If we could speak okay. on number 11 right now, that's what's before okay. us. Thank you. Anyway, again, we see the uh, fee waivers here. Uh, they're con constantly uh, using up all our uh, money for these fee waivers. And um, let's see. Anyway, um, you uh, you want to squander our money daily, and you want these fee waivers. But you want the city employees to get you out of the hole while you do fee waivers. And uh, well, the government has a huge deficit that Social Security hearing. We just hired 10 to 12 new employees, not counting judges, and it cut down our backlog. And But you people continue to do fee waivers. This is not right. How can you ask a lot of the city employees, ask them to do furloughs, and while you continue, a and while you continue ask, having to have these streets uh, closed down, so uh, that uses a lot of city money, uh, having to have all these streets closed while you're doing all these fee waivers. This is why our money doesn't, that's why we don't have any money over in the city because uh, you do all these fee waivers. In the meantime, we don't have the money because you give all our money to the CRA. Uh, with all their huge development, how can we afford to do all these fee waivers when we don't have any money? How can we afford to do any fee waivers when you want uh, we don't even have money for their city employees that you're threatening to do furloughs that um, you won't even look at and put the early retirement on the table? Why? Because we have all these money for fee waivers. Uh, it's about time we stop partying. We not we don't have any fun here. We you know people are going to lose their jobs. They don't have time for donut sprinklings and ribbon cuttings and parades. Then we got to stop doing these fee waivers. And I'm still mad that I didn't get to do public comment three times. I didn't do I get to have public comment. I'm going to remember this, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Donna Perman. Uh Our next speaker is Mayor Fogler. We'll look for that card very closely. <laughs> Are you going to let her speak? Because I'm going to Ms. call to Tom. Ms. Fogler, we're on, we're on item number 11 right now. I'm going to let right her know you're violating Ms. Fogler, our we're on item number 11 right now. Please go ahead and speak on that. And you're violating the laws of yourselves, all of you. Think Ms. You're Fogler, above the law? if you'd like to address number 11 right now, we'd love to hear your comments, but that is only the, the only comment that's before us right now. So please, if you could limit to that. I promise you we're looking everywhere for that card, and we always do that by the book. Please, number 11. Well, you all should be paying for these fee waivers out of your own pockets since you want them so bad. How, how, come this, how come you're making the city pay for it? You should be paying for it yourself since you want to ask city employees to give up everything. You should be the ones liable for all the debt. You're the ones that are signing the papers for all, the, uh, the, all these 
paying uh, fees that you're putting on the public, I think it's an outrage, and I hope the public be come and say, you know, Howard Jarvis said, enough is enough, we had it, we're not going to take it anymore. I hope there'll be somebody coming down here like another Howard Watson, Howard Jarvis, and Ernie Bernardi, thank and bless his beautiful memory, should be the, the, uh, that, that chamber you sit in should name after Ernie Bernardi. Not that uh, football player Ferraro who did nothing for the city and for the for the public. So he wouldn't he would condemn these fee waivers, Ernie Bernardi. He would not accept these. These are these are not to be condoned. And the mayor should be recalled for having these these fee waivers. Is he was supposed to put a moratorium on this? How dare he? He should be uh, going back to Sacramento so he can get a job back up there again. Leave our city alone. He should resign doing these outrageous fee waivers. This is criminal in nature. All of you are going to be responsible for paying for all these debts of the city and for the bankruptcy. They're going to put the restitution on you people for all your money you're making and put you, in, put you on trial. Then you'll be called criminals. In my opinion right now, you're innocent until proven guilty. Until then, I'm just letting uh, Arnold Sachs know that they need a day in court. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you Thank in court. You. Thank you, Ms. Fogler. That will close our comments on item 11. Please prepare. Uh, Mr. Roll. President, there is a uh, technical amendment on 11D, as in David, to change the time of the event to 12 to 3. Okay, is there any objection to that? If not, that will be accepted as a friendly amendment. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. And we did not find a card, Ms. Uh, Perman, but if you'd like to give us a minute of public comment, we'd be happy to give you a minute to reopen. Go ahead and from Van Nuys, Ms. Perman, if you'd like to come forward. And our, our clerks looked very hard, we promise you. Anyway, let's recall um, Mary Antonio and our governor, who has heard L.A. and city employees. I, I, anyway, um, see, you wouldn't let my friend speak to you on that time when she wanted to talk about city employees. And if city, uh, Mr. Guyton Bill should, uh, should speak against uh, city employees. He was in the LAUSD, and uh, what he, uh, he got his due let others. Uh, and others uh, our city council mayor and others squander our money daily. Now you want the city employees to get you out of the hole. Our federal government, as I said, has a huge deficit. Yet in Social Security or, uh, hearing office, we're hiring. So uh, that uh, helps us uh, with our backlog. So our city suffers with less service, with less employees. When more people become less efficient, everybody suffers. Why doesn't our city council ask more for... Uh, uh, amount for ugly digital billboards. Instead of asking for $100 for digital billboards, you can ask for $1,000. Our city is giving away our tax increment money to the CRA. Of course, with the pension scandal, you don't know how to take care of LA's money. How Thank can you, you ask much. for furlough if the, yeah, Thank how you can you much, ask Tom. for these things if you don't know how to take care of money? All right, uh, well, we'll close our reopen public comment. Well, now, uh, Mr. Rosendahl is asked to reconsider uh, item number six. There's no objection. Let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Is back before us, Mr. Rosendahl? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President, for that. Uh, could we have someone from the department come up and explain what we voted on? We may not have anyone here anymore. Do we? Is anybody here still? If we could hold it at the Maybe desk the, C and the CLA can, can probably listen to CLA would be great. Okay. Please. Great. Thank you, Mr. President, for that. Jerry, explain to us what we did rather quickly. There were two public comment cards on the issue. Um, you know, it had to do with the parking funds, and, and we obviously went through this in the budget process. We obviously have a huge deficit we're dealing with. But my constituents in the Palisades, who for years were working on a potential parking structure, people in Venice who have been working on a potential parking structure, parking is a big problem in the 11th district in some of the locations. Explain what we, we have done to close the budget gap. Well, what uh, what this provides for is a is a transfer of of surplus funds in the special parking revenue fund to the general fund to help offset costs that are incurred uh, primarily by the Department of Transportation. Mm. By surplus, what do you mean? I mean, it, th there's no surplus when you really want to build parking structures and other things like that. It it is uh, it, well correct. I mean, it, it's funding that that is that has been generated and and is available for projects or for transfer to the general fund. Mm -hmm. And so um, the decision we made to close the budget gap was to take the monies that were in the account 
uh, that might have, in my dreams, been used for a parking structure in the Palisades or Venice. How much money are we talking about that was surplus at the time? Uh, Mr. Rosenthal, um, with regard to the amount, I don't have the amount in front of me, but uh, as part of the actions on the by the Budget Committee and by the City Council, um, the monies that are going to be declared surplus would be declared surplus and loaned to close the budget gap. So uh, within a two-year time span, those funds are expected to be paid back into the fund to go back towards those projects. So there are a number of pieces that are happening at the same time. Uh, this is simply the ordinance that, that declares the surplus and allows the surplus to be transferred to the budget. Um, um, you will be getting a subsequent report from the CAO identifying specifically line item by line item where those funds are coming from. And as I indicated earlier, those funds would be on a loan basis. And those funds would be repaid per the ordinance within a two-year time span. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully paid. I mean, we're, we're going to have a, a worse year or the same bad year next year as we're having this year, so I don't know if in two years the loans will be repaid. We have to be candid about it. But going forward, I would like to build parking structures in the Venice area as well as in the Palisades. We're having difficult parking structure opportunities. Is there a way in which we can somehow figure out a strategy where we can set money aside even in these tough times? Could it be tied to putting up new meters, a certain percentage would go? Is there any strategies we're thinking about? Otherwise, I'll never get my parking structures. Those are certainly strategies. We, uh, yeah. it, with regard to additional parking meters and designating the funds, indeed, um, that's typically how the special parking revenue fund has been used. Uh, those monies are dedicated to uh, larger projects. Uh, I, I think that in, in the thinking in this budget, with regard to closing the gap, um, there is uh, probably an unlikely possibility that we would be building large construction projects like this to be funded from special parking revenue fund and if they were to happen it would be coming from MICLA and and MICLA would be backed by the general fund but at this time we didn't see the possibility of moving forward as you indicated within the next two years uh, with the severe uh, financial condition that the city is in um, the attempt as proposed by the mayor and as adopted by this council was to utilize some of those surplus plus funds and balance the budget and then with the hope of those monies coming back at some future time to do those projects, if there are additional meters, additional revenues that are being generated, yes, those monies could be dedicated to future projects. Okay, so that's the point I want to make clear to my constituents in the 11th district, that there really isn't a surplus, but it, it, it is money that hasn't been spent uh, at this particular moment that's going to be used to, to close the budget gap, uh, but that if we're looking at wanting to do something in the Palisades or in Venice or some of the other locations in my district, we need to cut a relationship deal with new meters going forward that a certain percentage could be used and maybe in a covenant sense preserved to be used, otherwise we'll never build these parking structures. Is that right? Is that kind of how we would have to do it? Well, I think that... Um I mean, there are several options that we're going to have to look at. I think this is going to be an opportunity to look at how we do off-street parking citywide and whether the, the current program works as, as it should. The world has changed since the 40s when we started this. Um, another option that you might look at is the P3 transaction, which involves parking structures and could generate, uh, possibly, if you move forward, a uh, fair well, Many of us on the P3, uh, especially yeah. the meters, uh, we've seen what's happened in Chicago. I wouldn't yeah. want to be that Mayor Daly at this point, his constituents are absolutely furious with him yeah. because he's given up control of that public access uh, asset to the private sector to the degree that the public can't even park anymore. I mean, they're going to ride him out in a rail, and I don't, I don't want uh, us to go through that same insanity here in Los Angeles on that P3. Okay, I just wanted to bring the issue up so people know in a ho-hum way that this is a big deal, what we're doing uh, with our parking uh, funds uh, to close the gap at the expense of us building uh, parking structures at this very moment in certain locations. We have to tighten our belt and we have to deal with the reality of our budget. But going forward, uh, we look forward to putting specific programs together so the folks in my district understand that there will be parking structures eventually if we tie it into future meters and future operations. Thank you both very much for that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rosenau. Mr. President. Yeah, uh, we'll prepare the roll on this item again and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item 12, called special for cards. Okay, item 
12 is our next one, and we have Zuma Dog. Ian Van Nuys. Fear well, of sanitation do that to clean out the... I'm number 12. Things are falling apart here. We'll pass because 11 you didn't call and have knocked everything off. We had cards in 11. Pass on this. Oh, we had the hearing on 11, sir. Um, Mr. Dowd uh, has a card in on number 12 as well. This is, the mis this is the mistake. It should be 11. It's 12. We had them in on 11, obviously. Now they're calling 12. Obviously a mistake. We don't know about sanitation, right, sure. Tom. Did you Randy. want to talk about 12? Or Mr. Dowd, did you want to talk about number 12? Mistake. It was supposed to be 11. It's a mistake. Oh, 11. Okay. We had them in on Thank 11. You. So both are waving. Yeah. Mr. Dowd, would you like to speak on this? Um, I actually want to speak on 11, and I had a card, and I'll wait for that. Thank you. Okay. That will... Uh, by the time that will open the roll for the council, close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve aisles. That is approved. Next item, please. Item 16, called special for cards. Okay. Mr. Dog, item number 16, and Mr. Dowd, item number 16. Are we coming back to 11? <clears throat> Let's talk about track maps. Um, okay, now the thing about track maps, and I, I, <clears throat> the answer is no. I do not want this track map to prove. We have no more room in the city. We have a water crisis due to the fact that Gray Davis in 2002, in a meeting with Vivendi that was a pay-for-play through Weatherly Capital, chose to ignore the water crisis. So now to continue, we have water crises. We can't be building more things. We can't. We don't. We can't guarantee water, and that's when people die on the streets. It's population control is what we're having here. Your track maps, I'm saying, is population control because you know elderly and people die without water. So what do you do? You build so much housing and you cram them full of people all over the city, and then you don't have water, and then people die. Also. Density causes crime. The more these you prove, the more dense it gets. Ask New York City. That's crime. We do not have the infrastructure. I know that the council's theory is to make it like New York City. We don't have the subways. We don't have the buses. We don't have anything. Okay? And <laughs> you don't even have enough money to patrol or enforce your own city. You don't have fire. You don't have the police. We're closing libraries. We're closing parks. People. It's like if you have two kids and you lose your job and don't have any money, you don't keep having kids. You cannot afford it. You cannot afford to operate your own city. You blew it. You cannot afford any more of this. Don't you see the madness, people? And I'll try to calm down, but the answer is no. Now, there's too much pay for play. The thing is, to get these things approved, all you have to do is give money to the council members. And I'm especially concerned with the low-income housing that I understand. I'm not going to get it. Okay. <laughs> Eric's a good guy. I don't want to get into this now. But the answer is no. We don't have enough schools. We don't have enough police. We don't have enough fire. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough water. We don't have enough space. We don't have enough anything. If you could lower your voice a little bit, sir. Thank you. Thank you for waiting till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that will lead us to Mr. Dowd on item number 16. Get in. Get in. So I, I do need a clarification because I think I only have one minute left and I'd prefer to use it on minute, item sir. 11. If you, I need to know if you're going to reconsider that because I had a card on 11. No, sir. We're on item number 16. You're we have the hearing for number 11. It. Go ahead. Your time is ticking on number 16, please, sir. All right. So I'm sure the general public on Channel 35 can see what's happening. But let me tell you what, general public... See, people get up here, we talk about these track maps, and you, what, you complain about traffic, and you complain about density. Anybody out there who's complaining about the city council has got nothing to complain about because you voted them in. You, they're your representatives. So I don't want to hear another complaint on Talkback Radio. I don't want to hear a complaint about the city council from anyone. See, the only people who I want to listen to are CD5. Excuse me, sir, we're here on the track maps, if we could uh, keep to that, sir. Right, and, and the track maps are the blueprint for the density in this city, and the density is what creates the traffic chaos. Thank you very much, and Mr. So, I will. That's uh, five minutes expired, and if we can please, if no council members wish to be heard, open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item 17, call special by Councilmember Gruel. Recognize Ms. Gruel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I just wanted to, this is a, a motion that uh, Mr. LeBond signed with me as well, which is looking at um, 
cookie cutter project RFPs. Um, and this motion instructs the staff to come back to look at shortening construction time for some of these types of projects. Um, specifically, it looks at the preparation of procedures for such projects and the development of list of qualified contractors and the use of mini RFPs. Um, it was approved by the Arts Parks uh, Committee. Um, and what it does, colleagues, is that we um, have soccer fields that we put um, you know, build out there and tennis courts and skate park components and other things that we don't need to recreate the wheel every time that we do it and the cost associated with it. And as we look at uh, trying to save money and efficiencies in Los Angeles, this is a way um, that I think uh, we can uh, do that. And so it asks the city staff to de develop these kinds of procedures and to come back um, to us for final approval um, to, to streamline this process and to be able to save us some time and money and to be able to get projects out there uh, quickly. So. I just wanted to highlight that we were, were looking at this to the public and to encourage an I vote, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, if we can open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Mr. President, do you wish to recess the regular and go into the special? Yes, please. Go to the special meeting. And that would leave you item 18, call special for cards. Okay. Uh, Zuma Dog is our speaker on number 18. And after that, we have Matt Dowd, one minute each. Please. I'm sorry, Zuma Dog has two, and Mr. Dowd has one. Go ahead, Mr. Dowd. Hold two on, minutes. hold on. I'm on the phone, but hold on, person on the phone. Yes, we're talking about the very important call, very Westfield project. And you know what? First of all, there's an appeal, okay, and it's being sent through the neighborhood councils. This this has to be put on hold. The appeal has not been signed yet. And if you'd like, if anybody watching would like to see the appeal from Westfield, just send an email to zoomadog at gmail dot com. I've got the complete appeal. It's outrageous. You know, again. Here's the way the city works. You have the community, you have the neighborhood. They want to, you know, the members that just want to live their lives without being crushed by cement and trucks and developers and Jack Weiss money that this is all due to. And, you know, it's just money related. You know what? There's no freedom, people. You got no voice. The people didn't want this. The money came in. The cement trucks rolled in. Democracy's been steamrolled. It's been cemented over. You can't get anything done in this city unless you're paying money unless you're kicking back money the campaign contributions the community doesn't have a chance just pour a, a bunch of cement right over them city council i hope all your family gets dumped on it too so i would just ask uh, please if you would uh, try to give us um, advice on the policies and refrain from personal remarks as much as possible our code of conduct for speech protects all free speech and all perspectives um, but to not make that personal. We are respectful of you. We would ask the same uh, from you as well. Mr. Matt Dowd is our last speaker. One minute. Yeah, if you were respectful of us, you would have held a public comment that we had in. So you're not respectful. This is disrespect for the voters, this item here. This is disrespect for the community. It's disrespect for anyone with children. Disrespect for anyone who cares about the future. Because it's just another massive development project Another agreement between Westfield, U.S. and the city of Los Angeles. See, this is what they're trying to do now, people. And they're really pissing me off here with all this shenanigans that goes on with these public comments. Because there's a phone right here, and they, they, these things should be in. But if you, if you see, here's the point, Dion O'Connell. If you can't even Sir, run you a meeting... please address the city council. And you've been warned about that before, so that will cut off your public comment for today. Um, we do have policies, which I know you're very familiar with. We will bend over backwards to protect your free speech, and I know you've had um, minutes of that today, and we'll continue to do that. But uh, the rules are to directly address the council and not individual council members or the uh, city attorney. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your abiding by that. Well, please prepare the roll on this item and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Thank you. That is approved. Just one final note on, on, uh, on the public speech today. Uh, we do uh, take very seriously and have a more robust uh, policy on, on speech and both penalties on speech uh, here uh, than it, many of our other bodies. Uh, Board of Supervisors, for instance, has a policy where people can't come back for um, over a month in violating those policies. We really do 
uh, feel strongly about protecting people's free right to speech um, and those ideas. This, however, is not a forum for people to attack, engage in slander, and to go after individuals, um, but one to express opinions. Um, that is what the Brown Act is designed for. Uh, our, we have been reviewing and re-reviewing the court cases on this and we, uh, with the help of the city attorney, and we've taken uh, always a more lenient um, approach to speech and protected speech than many of our other fellow bodies. Or we hope that the members of the public know that. Um, we'd like to continue to point that out, regardless of what some individual speakers may be and we'll protect those individual speakers but we will use our free speech too to ask them to do that in the most respectful um, and um, as uh, straightforward manner as possible. With that, can we go to the next order of business? Mr. President, do you wish to adjourn the special meeting and go back to the regular? Yes, please. Council has motions for posting and referral. Those motions are posted and referred. There are excuses on the desk. Councilmember Garcetti requests to be excused June 16th, 17th, and 19th for personal business and I'm June... I'm sorry. We have one other item to, that, to reconsider. My apologies. Uh, if, item number seven. If we can go ahead and reconsider item seven. And open the roll and close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. And Mr. Reyes, uh, item number seven. Thank you, Council President. Colleagues, uh, what's before us is the supporting implementation of SB 375 under Legislator uh, Steinberg. Essentially, it's to comply with SB 32 regarding climate change by reducing car and truck emissions through more sustainable local land use and transportation planning. We have heard this item in Plum Committee and have asked for regular report backs as the implementation plan progresses. Currently, the state is in the process of creating baseline data. It is important that we have a seat at the table during these discussions. Equally important will be the development of transportation modeling that accurately reflects neighborhood level data and trip reduction strategies that are consistent with promotion of transit-oriented districts and reduce dependence on the automobile. And what we're really saying here, folks, is that as we look at our transportation centers where our rail lines and our rail stations are being contemplated, where we have more than two or three bus lines and busways converging in intersections, we can promote transit-oriented districts, which allows us more housing around these rail stations helps us deal with alternative modes of transportation, and we start modeling, counting how many trips we're saving as a result of people living closer to these public transit centers, living closer to their jobs. So we're reducing the trips on the streets. So all this technical language really translates into what some folks call smart growth. Uh, others don't like the notion of density, but we're trying to be opportunistic with our infrastructure and how it's being built out in the future. So it is imperative that our community plan updates encourage smart growth principles that demonstrate reduced emissions in compliance with state law. These community plans updates must remain a priority within the planning department and we encourage, I encourage my colleagues to make outreach and input regarding these updates a high priority in their communities. It will determine where housing and transit will be located and will shape the sustainability of our cities for a long time to come. So colleagues, as our staff is able to engage the state, SCAG, when we look at these modeling programs, it really is about how we start looking at our local communities so that when investment does occur, the community folks are there and understand and can predict where housing can be built, it will cut out time within the process, which means developments are not as costly, which means housing can become more affordable. So it's all connected, and these are the types of plans that have to emerge through our community plan and hopefully save the city hundreds and thousands of dollars, the developers hundreds of thousands of dollars, and maybe more revenue for community benefits ecologically sensitive structures and developments, as well as other ways of transporting the folks from their work to their home to school that are not dependent on the automobile. So we are talking about the future of the city. I thank you for your support. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. Let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. And if we can send item fifth, uh, 16 forthwith to without objection. Um, we are on excuses. and. Thank you.
Yeah, go ahead. Councilmember Garcetti, request to be excused June 16th, 17th, and 19th for personal business, and June 23rd and 24th for city business. They meet council policy. Okay. He is excused. Councilmember Zion, request to be excused June 10th to arrive at 1045 for city business. That meets council policy. He is excused. Councilmember Lamont, request to be excused September 9th to arrive at 1130 for city business. That meets council policy. He is excused. And Councilmember Goal, request to be excused Friday, June 12th to leave at 1130 for city business. That meets council policy. She is excused as well. That clears the desk. Any announcements, colleagues? If not, do we have any adjourning motions today? Are there any adjourning motions today? The, uh, Mr. Lange? Just to remind people that the Department of Water and Power's emergency water ordinance went into effect on June 1st. Thank so, you for that uh, reminder. We've got to conserve our water. I've got to try to be the best I can. LADWP for more information. LADWP.com. Are there announcements? Do we have adjourning motions? If I can ask everybody in council chambers to please rise for our adjourning motions today. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Andrew L. Wallace, Jr., uh, He's been at our council for a number of times. He's a, a former member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, he was born October 1925 and passed away on May 28, 2009. At the age of five, he and his family moved to L.A. He's a graduate of Manual Arts High School. Uh, after high school, he entered the Air Force. It was part of the Tuskegee exp experience. He was uh, uh, honorably discharged in 46 and attended Lincoln University for one year before returning to L.A. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Chapman, a uh, master's degree from California State University at L.A. In 53, he went to work for the county probation department and retired in 80, 1984 after 31 years. Uh, he's married in 1957 uh, to his wife Lois and they've had two children. Uh, Andrew also serves as the treasurer of the Hollywood uh, Civil Rights Education Foundation. He actually participated in the 1963 March on Washington. He's also a past member of the Black Probation Office Association and many other civic organizations. Funeral services will be held Wednesday, June 3rd, 10 a.m. at Angela's Funeral Home on South Crenshaw. He's survived by his wife, Lois, and his two children. Thank you very much, Ms. Hahn, and then Ms. Gould. Thank you. I'd like us to adjourn in the memory of Federico David Lico Valdez. Um, who passed away on May 24th in San Pedro. Uh, he was born on January 9th, 1949 uh, in Avalon and was a lifetime resident of the Harbor area. He graduated from San Pedro High School in 1967 and proudly served in the U.S. Army Green Berets. Lico was a longtime member of the Redmond Sequoia Lodge 140 and the Elks Lodge uh, number 966. Um, he was preceded in death by his father, David Romo, he is survived by his wife, Leslie, son, Timothy L. Taylor, daughters, Margaret Ann, Ursula, and uh, Mikhail Mary, uh, mother, Dolores Valdez, brothers, Jorge and Raul, sister, Carmen, and five grandchildren. Uh, according to all of them, he brought a smile to all that knew him, and he will be greatly missed. Funeral services were held today at McNerney's Mortuary. Thank you. Let's go. Cool. Colleagues, I mentioned to you a week or so ago about my family that was murdered. And we didn't get an opportunity to um, give them a, a full tribute and ask if you would join in memory of uh, my, my second cousins, um, Brock and Davina Husted, who unspeakable tragedy um, killed in Ventura, also um, passed away, it was their unborn son, Grant. Um, she was five months, Davina was five months pregnant. Um, Brock and Davina were 42 years old, um, longtime residents of Ventura County. Uh, Brock um, was the youngest of seven kids, and if any of you know someone has a big family, I know you, Tony, that the youngest one is usually the joker, having to get attention to the rest of them, and that was uh, was Brock over the years, and um, an incredible funny and happy um, young man. Um, they had two beautiful children, um, Isabella and, and Brock. And uh, Brock and Davina met, met each other through his brother, Scott. And um, Davina was one of those incredibly beautiful, graceful, um, incredible um, young women. And, and we used to tease Brock, how was he so lucky to have found her and, and getting to her agree to marry him. 
And, you know, during the holiday, she was the one that just made everything happen as we spent Christmases together. Uh, Davina um, and Brock were married on September 9th, 1995. Um, their children, um, Isabel is 11 and Brock is 9. Davina was from a family in Somas, a farming family where they still live, um, and uh, Brock and his family, well-established family of Moore Park, California. Um, Davina um, had both her real estate and brokerage licenses. She graduated at the top of her class in Sawyer Business School. She was Miss Oxnard in 1987. Um, she worked with Brock in their company that they had. Um, a wrought iron a trade company called Couture Concepts in Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, they had a very successful business there. She was the bookkeeper and uh, he ran uh, the business. Um, he was, was someone uh, who uh, people loved to do work with. He was reliable, hardworking and a, a person who loved to go to Laker games. They had season tickets and in fact um, uh, Davina had been very sick through her pregnancy, morning sickness, and um, had not been able to go to the games. And, and although he was disappointed with that, he got to go with his friends. And so they were just about ready to, to go back. She felt better, and they were going to go to the game this last week or so together. Um, she was very involved in the National Charity League, and um, over 900 people attended the services on Saturday. Um, one that was a celebration of their lives. Um, and what they were able to give. And I just only hope that we can um, find the person who did this to them um, and to be able to support their family. Um, they have a very large family um, survived um, by my uh, great aunt Helen um, and his uh, brothers and, and sisters, uh, Helen's uh, stepfather, Frank Gorman, my cousin Scott and Tamara Husted, John and Monica Husted, um, his sister Cindy Husted, Sam Hayward, and Nancy um, Kalo, um, he, he was preceded in death, my cousin Brock, by his father, um, Winfield Scott Houston, and his sister, uh, Kimberly Catherine Houston, who was killed in a car accident. Davina um, survived by um, her parents, David and Elaine DeBoney, a brother Vincent and his wife Carolyn, and their son Connor, and um, again, numerous um, nieces and nephews and cousins. and. Um, I spent um, some days with them and nights, um, and the fact that family brought them together and kept them together, and so I ask that we adjourn their memory and send them our prayers. Absolutely, we'll do all members on that. Thank you very much, Ms. Crow. Are there uh, uh, any other adjourning motions? If not, Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Our next meeting.